very cut coffee. Quick Hello, drink of water. welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 96, Feeling the Heat, Summer AMA. I'm Sean, not Hamilton, but from Hamilton, and live from Windsor, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the Archie, all right, that, that, that came out well. Ah! <clears throat> Yeah, edit number one, possibly. Or we'll just leave it in, because you know what? I usually get that perfect. It's like the first time I screwed it up in a long time. So I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. You can join us Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, besides answering questions from our chat room live tonight, uh, we have a ton of feedback from last week's topic. Uh, that was dealing with stubborn players, stubborn gamers, not willing to try new things. It's probably the most feedback we've ever gotten on a single topic. I've also got a preview of Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. This is the latest Valeria game from Daily Magic Games. And then for our week in review, I've got my first thoughts on a game called Katana. Uh, and a game called Super Cats. Then I also have a bit more info on Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria, including a solo play, and an attempt to play The Mind with my two girls. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we receive, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We crave your comments and suggestions. If you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media. I personally can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Well, it seems we touched a nerve with last week's topic of gaming picky eaters and what to do with a gamer who isn't try willing to try new things. We got significantly more and yeah. longer feedback than I think we've ever seen on any topic yeah. in the past. We'll Very highlight true. some of those comments in a bit. But up first, a few comments on other content, starting with a couple of people excited to see our Sanctum unboxing. First, David Fox commented, Those minis look sweet! Followed one minute later by, this game looks sweet, wow! And Hungry Gamer posted, I've been tempted by this one several times. Well, thanks for the comments, David and Hungry. I, I think I'm, we might have to bump up our plays of this one and try to get a review out sooner than later because people seem to really be drooling over this one. Also on Twitter, like these are just things on our videos. Like every time I share a picture of it, people are like, ooh, what's that? Does it really play like Diablo? Oh, look at the minis. People are really hyped over this game. So, yeah, I think that one we're going to have to bump to the top of the list. All right. Well, Andrew Dacey, patron of the show, commented on our Mermaid Adventures review to say, mm -hmm. I'm listening to the latest tabletop bellhop, and now I totally want to make the Happy Kraken as a fantasy tavern. <laughs> Go for it, Andrew. Just make the bartender be Sean, since it was him that came up with it. That's S-E-A-N. All right. Well, on to the comments. Last week's topic of gaming picky eaters. Brock Wagner writes, Ugh. This drives me nuts. It's fine and dandy to have your preferences, but when you categorically refuse to play something that isn't your absolute favorite game genre setting, I just want to scream. Worse, <laughs> if they refuse to play because they can't be their favorite color. Well, thanks for the comment, Brock. Uh, I totally get your frustration, though I still have to repeat something I said during the show last week. While it can be annoying... I don't actually blame the picky eater that much, really. Everyone approaches this hobby in a different way and has their own way to find fun when gaming. If that fun doesn't work with the rest of the group, yeah, it's time to move on and find a group that it does work with. Now, as far as only playing one color, in that case, you know what? This, If you're that picky, that player might be better off just gaming online because sites like Yukata, you get to pick your preferred color and... That's how it shows on your monitor the whole time. It doesn't matter. It's like technically Sean and I could both be playing yellow on our own monitor. So you always get your own color. Because I got to say, not playing an in-person game due to not getting the right color seems to me a bit over the top. Like that, that again, that's above picky eater. To me, that seems to get into problem player territory. And I think in general, if someone's going to be that picky about what color they play, this is probably someone you're not going to enjoy playing with anyway. 
Now, another note, BGA does let you choose your favorite color, but it can be overridden. You actually have to pick three or four colors. Uh, and if two people have the same favorite, the game flips a coin to see who is going to uh, get the color of that game. I'll start. Now, Adam Bragg has some advice for us in this comment. Be clear in stating up front when, when, what you want your game to be. If the player doesn't match this, then either they won't attend or they will attend, hoping to change your game to suit their tastes. Mm. If they choose the latter, then they are putting their fun ahead of everyone else's uninvite them. However, don't move the goalposts on a player without just cause. If the issue is that the player only wants to play a murder hobo fighter merc in a group of people who add backstory and social intrigue to their characters, then let him be a boring, no personality character who just shows up and does the minimum. Such people <laughs> exist in real life. You could even Fair. have it that the other PCs and NPCs acknowledge this behavior in the character and act accordingly. When the NPC patron asks the engaged PCs for their opinion and blatantly states they won't bother asking Captain Humdrum for their non-existent opinion, perhaps it will motivate the player to engage more. Or everyone will, will chuckle at Flatline Freddy and the game moves on with good old Flatline wordlessly swinging his axe at every foe. All right. Well, thanks for the great comment, Adam. Uh, well, we did talk a lot last week about setting expectations through things like session zero is having inter sessions further on during your, your, when your group gets together at different times. I do think the point here about moving the goalposts is a good thing. If you agree to let a player play the thing they always play, don't then try to do things in the game to punish that player for doing it. Now, yeah. Ian Borchardt is confused by the picky eater. They write, some friends in uni played 1830 three times a week for nearly two years. This is something I will never understand. Well, thanks, Ian. Uh, sticking to the same game, though, is definitely a thing. Uh, some people like those lifestyle games. And I got to say, in particular, train games, 18xx games, train games in general seem to attract these style of gamers. Like, there is a worldwide tournament scene that you can get involved in where you'll go to, like, Origins and Cons where they have a section walled off just for these people to play train games in. It's called Puffing Billy. We actually took part in it one year at Origins just to check it out. I didn't play any 18xx games. But there are people that dedicated to playing train games. So it doesn't surprise me that there are people playing train games and only train games, even a specific one. I know 1830 is considered one of the better, more competitive versions of the 18XX games. Though I got to say, if I was playing 18XX three times a week, I better not have a day job or anything where I need to think because my brain would just be smoking constantly. All right. Well, <clears throat> Todd Zercher writes, I avoid such people as a rules collector reader. I always have 10 or 12 new shiny things I want to try. And with the pandemic freebies and bundles, I now have two or 300 new games to try. Well, I, I feel slightly responsible probably with some of those pandemic freebies. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, head over to tabletopbellhop.com. We got a list of over 200 free print and play games. And we got a list of like over 50 free RPG PDFs you can get for free. But overall, I am with you there, Todd. Definitely. Um, I think most people have seen pictures of my pile of shame. We've talked about it in the, in, on the show before. I am definitely someone who is all about uh, trying new games. Not necessarily the new hotness, but at least new to me games. Yeah, well, uh, Dian Li Zhang writes, Personally, I just stop inviting that play over when I player over when I want to try something different. Well, thanks for the comment, Denali. Uh, personally, I that, that seems a little passive-aggressive to me. I, I think it's best to sit down and have a conversation first, see if you can come up with some kind of compromise, something like... Um, you know, this week we play your favorite game, next week you don't show up, and then the next week we'll play, when we play it again, we'll call you or something like that. Uh, but you know what? Sometimes, though, no longer inviting a picky eater to game night is the best solution. So it is definitely a viable way to go. All right, well, Neil Helmer wrote to say, this is tricky. My group of friends, our regular group, could be described as picky, myself included. We basically jury our own purchases made in our group benefit. We talk about games way before bringing them to the table, and most often before even purchasing them. Mm -hmm. We all have stuff we're going to buy anyway, and that being the case, we're all willing to try a new game if it falls within our general parameters. 
which we will generally give a minimum of three to five plays before any serious decisions are made. And this includes games where a thumbs up was given ahead of time. After initial plays in any regular night with nothing new on the table and indecision reigns, all of us may issue a veto on games we're not fond of, fond of with a three quarters majority in favor over ruling. Works pretty good if you have a group that has similar tastes and members not buying games without prior research. I'm also lucky that my regular group is comprised mostly of friends of over 20 years who have no problem to tell each other to off if they put something ridiculous on the table. <laughs> that just makes me want to show up and throw, I don't know, I, I, I could see Go Cuckoo with that group getting getting that F word Bean. to come out. Uh, you know. <laughs> Bonanza. Oh, they're like any of the super cats we're talking about later. If I brought, I, if I go to Joe's house ever again, I'm going to have to bring super cats. So go. thanks, Neil. Obviously, I know Neil. I know Neil's group. Um, now, in Neil's situation, it works, right? Because this is kind of what we talked about, that if there's a picky eater in your group, the pick eaters probably, and, and you want to play new things, the pick eaters probably in the wrong group. So what Neil has found over the years is a group of picky eaters and all of the picky eaters have yeah. gathered together and they like to play the same game over and over until they master it and then move on to the next game and sorry, move on to the next game and master that one and then get another game. And they have a very small catered collection where they play the same things all the time. And this is why I suggested that, right? Like, make a group of all picky eaters and you're probably going to have a great group that are all going to have a great time all the time. Right. If if you don't like peas, there's another group out there that won't eat peas with you. <laughs> now, Francois Uldry has a comment about one of your suggestions. They write, I would not have used D&D 4 as a tactical game. I would have used Fantasy Trip as an okay. example. First, it promotes rarer gaming systems. And second, the game is built as a combat system with an RPG element added on top. There are many games more tactical than any D&D editions. I think most D&D fans would say 4th edition is a tactical system with an RPG thrown on top, if there's an RPG element at all. But thank you for the comments, Francois. Uh, I gotta say, there are two reasons I picked 4E D&D. The, the main one being that it is D&D, and everyone knows about it. It is, is the most accessible RPG on the market, and it's also very easy to learn. 4E D&D is great for new players. It, it has a great onboarding system. I know a lot of people hate the card system and hate the power system, but you know what? With all your options presented in front of you, it's a heck of a lot easier to respond when the DM looks at you and goes, what do you do? That is very difficult for new players. So that is one of the main reasons. And the other reason is it's probably the most tactical RPG I personally played. I haven't had the pleasure of trying Steve Jackson's The Fantasy Trip. Um, based on the name I gave the first RPG I ever wrote, I had obviously never even heard of The Fantasy Trip. But it is not a game that I'm going to recommend because I haven't played it. But it does sound like if you have some tactically minded players out there that like skirmish based combat in the role playing games, that might be the game to check out. All right. Well, next up, Random Girl had this to share. My wife and I wrote a book in 2012, which is a generic system for live action role playing. She did the math. We both worked on mechanics. She managed all the items and powers. I worked with some powers and a lot of skills. And I wrote the section on how to actually GM the game itself. I have a small section in the book dealing with problem players. My first piece of advice there is to try and understand their problem, the, the problem that their behavior is trying to solve, and then use various mm -hmm. techniques to clarify and deliver on it if possible. If they're happy, they're less inclined to act out, and everyone has fun. Okay. I also very clearly state, uh, also advise clearly stating boundaries for all of the players, so that when, inevitably, someone violates them, it's less likely to come down to he said, she said as to whether bad behavior occurred at all. And finally, I wrote that if you game master a game, you're doing it because it's fun. Unless you're one of the very rare people who gets paid to do it. In which case, um, you're getting paid to do it. Suck it up. If someone in the group is depriving you of that fun, making it work, you have, uh, making it work, you have to have the right to address your concerns with that person. And if they do not correct their behavior, ask them to leave your game. All right. Thanks for the comment, Random Girl. I got to say, this is all some great advice. Some really good stuff there. Uh, some of that could have easily been in our last episode. Getting to the root of the problem is very important. And getting to the root of the problem and being able to find out what's wrong and solving that does 
stop the same situation from coming up again and again and again, which is fantastic. Some really good advice. Thank you there. All right, well, Gene Chu has a different has a different perspective on this problem. I have the exact opposite problem. How do you deal with a player who is unwilling to replay any games? <laughs> a friend of mine introduced me to the board hobby in a big way. I really appreciate that he has introduced me to a wide variety of games, including games of genres that I likely never would have even bothered to try out. I have discovered a lot of games that I now really enjoy, even a few that I never thought I would like so much. It seems whenever we get together, he wants to play something that we've never played before. I can sort of understand this situation. Yep. Now, the problem is that I do want to achieve some level of mastery over the games that I enjoy playing. Part of what I enjoy about gaming in general is that intermediate phase of playing a game where I know enough to know what I'm doing, but there is enough I don't know that I'm still learning new things about the game. I feel that personal growth, or I feel that personal growth when I figure out some new strategy or improve upon an existing strategy. It's that trying new things within the game that gets me excited. The thing that really pisses me off about him is that he often comments about the replay value of the game. Like, he never seems to replay games, so he seems to have little credibility when he talks about <laughs> replay value. Okay. I think part of the reason he doesn't replay games with me is that he feels I am able to pick up strategy much better than he can. Now, I have ruined Dominion for him. I take the blame for that because I love the game so much that I got the app and played it hundreds of times before our next play and ended up soundly crushing everyone. I'm mindful of that and don't research strategy on my own if I intend to play a game with him again. Outside of that, he seems to want to make sure I'm on the same level playing field as he and the rest of the group is. I once asked what game we plan to play so I could read the rules, not strategy, beforehand. He wouldn't tell me and made me learn the game at the table like everybody else. Wow. Um, well, there's a lot to unpack there, Gene. Uh, thanks for reaching out. Thanks for the comment. Uh, we probably could have made this a whole podcast episode. Um, first off, you got to thank that friend for getting into the hobby. That That's awesome. Having someone like that that introduces you to new games. That That is amazing. Um, they have done you a great service. But I think they're doing you quite a bit of a disservice uh, by not wanting to play games because you beat them. Like, that's just ridiculous. Like, you shouldn't feel shame for learning to play a game well and beating the other people you're playing with. The, the point of the game is to try to win. And then trying to keep everyone on the same level playing field at during game night, what, that is just weird. Like, that's weird, overbearing, and controlling to me and seem honestly unhealthy. Like, I hate to say it, but I would be getting out of that group as quickly as I could. Because playing games is supposed to be fun, not necessarily fair. Like... No one running any game night should be trying to have this level of control where everyone's supposed to be at the same skill level and you can't read the rules ahead of time because you'll have an unfair advantage. Like, like to be honest, that seems a little nuts to me. I don't know. You have any thoughts on this one? Like, yeah, this, like, this, this is... the whole comment was a rail railroad. Like, yeah, it starts it off is. like, oh, <laughs> this guy's teaching him games. This is great. And I'm like, oh, except he likes to play new games all the time. And, and he's always talking about replay. And then all of a sudden that end bit about like, oh, yeah, don't it... show up. If, Huh. It's interesting because, again, I feel about you much the same way in that first paragraph. Um, mm. You know, again, you introduced me to the hobby board game situation, and I yep. am incredibly appreciative uh, of it. Um, and at the same time, I do play mostly new games when we go down. Now, yep. not exclusively new games. It's not like we never we never play anything else again. And thankfully, online, we get a chance to play lots of things over and over yep. again. Um, but. I also know that when I am going down, there's a reason why we're not playing new games. And often or you have new games that I want to try. So I'm not pushing for, you know, playing that same game over and over again. I, I don't want Carcassonne on the table every time I come down um, or, you know, Steam or, whatever. you know, hey, whatever. Yeah. But <laughs> Carcassonne is probably the, the worst example I could have come up with. Yeah. But Pulsar, um, Pulsar, or Pulsar Horizons, I know Horizons you know, really Steam, you know, all, the, all the, you know, heavier stuff that, that really does reward that extra playing. Yeah. I, I understand exactly what he's talking about with that in-between level. Yeah. Um, I, I do get that because I, I, I miss that feeling in some ways uh, going down, but there are also enough games uh, like the level I'm at in Terraforming Mars when we're playing online is a lot like that, right? I haven't played mm -hmm. it nearly as much as you guys. So I'm still finding new things to, to try and play and 
and develop on that one. So I do enjoy getting it to the table again and would regret not playing it again. Uh, yep. But if you are so concerned about a player that you won't even tell him what game you're playing because you think he might be that much better than you, there's a real problem there. And yeah. that is probably not the right table to be at. <laughs> there's there's definitely yeah, some, just... some, some concerns in the relationship uh, dynamics there that need to be addressed outside of gaming. Um, it's yeah. just, you know showing itself in, in gaming, but there, there are definitely some concerns there. Like the, the point of hosting a game night isn't to stroke your own ego. Like Indeed. <laughs> I, 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 I don't, that, that, that seems like a unhealthy relationship. Yep. And I, I've no gene. I don't know gene personally, but it's someone I interact with fairly regularly online. And I've seen him comment on it every now and then about not playing games online. Cause he doesn't want to learn them that well. And it always kind of confused me and seeing this, I, it now makes a lot more of his comments make sense. Right. <laughs> but like, I, I feel bad. Like I, I get it. You don't want to abandon the person who introduced you to gaming. They, they did you a huge service. They did something awesome for you. And I get it. But I, I guess the only other thing I would add is have you mentioned this to them? Like, have, have you talked about it? Yep. So at this point, I'm thinking you may just want to get away quicker than that. I don't know. I, this is yep. rough. I, and I feel bad for you, Gene. All right, well, moving on. Um, Chris Groff has a good question here. They write... Suggestion. Suggestions, right. What about hosting your own game nights for the games you want to play? If, you know... I gotta say, this is kind of the perfect solution. Like, how did we miss this? We we're talking about all the things you can do, and from the perspective of the picky eater, why don't you just make your own game night? If you're that picky, if all you want to play is Catan, set up a Catan game night. Or if all you want to play is Barbarians in a D&D game, you're the one that sets it up, going, hey, I want to play Barbarians in a D&D game. Is there anyone who wants to DM a Barbarian? Because I want to play Barbarians. You can use my host. Come over here. Here's here's what I'd like to do. Or whatever it happens to be, right? I love superhero games. That was the going back to the actual question. It was someone who liked playing superhero games in particular. Is I want to play a superhero game. Maybe you run it, but maybe you find someone else to run it. But, like, you know what? The only thing is do make sure you have a session zero where you talk about this, right? Like, let people know what you want. If you want to make a Catan night, let people know it's a Catan night, not just a board game night. Because you want to make sure you don't show up and go, yeah, we're playing Catan on Saturdays. Everyone show up. Everyone shows up Saturday. You play Catan. The next week you play Catan. Then the third week they're like, oh, you know what? We're sick of Catan. I brought this game instead. And you're like, whoa, whoa, no, that's... I want a Catan night. That's why I set this up, right? So yeah. have that session zero to let people know that you want to do it. Though don't, again, going back to what we talked about with the, the intermission session, right? The the mid-session, I forget what we called it before, the um, sessions, uh, session recap. I forget. We had a cool yeah. term for it. Now I forget. The, the session recap, have that, right? Like now that you have played Catan five weeks, maybe one of the players is like, you know, I thought I was going to like playing Catan all the time, but you know what? I'm not. Uh, session reboot intermission like i said intermission session i like that term have one of those and be like you know what when i first showed up it was fun but now i'm a little sick of it but yeah i i think that's a great solution like i said i, I can't believe we never thought of the fact that yeah the picky eater make your own group not go find a new group like that's a thing well i guess it's still the same thing i when i was thinking go find a new group i was thinking there'd be an existing group out there somewhere nebulously that they would <laughs> m met up with but, but they can always make their own turn. yep absolutely um again you know Go back to go back to eating, right? If if you refuse to ever eat peas, there's other people out there who will join you in that love of not eating peas. Yep. Uh, you and can have a no peas buffet. At your own <laughs> there you go. Night. Uh, and if you are hosting your own game night, I personally think it is completely within your rights to choose the color of peas you're going to play. If you're, <laughs> there you go. That's that's the, the one. Host. You know, if you're the host, you can you can pick your color first. Well, that's totally it fair. for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. A few quick announcements before we continue. All right, I say this every week. I'm wondering if I should stop saying it every week, but you know what? We want more people to sign up. Uh, sign up and get the Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. This is an email I send out once a week that recaps all the content we released the week previous. Uh, it's a great spot to get everything in one place so you don't miss anything we've released because I know following that Twitter stream or our Facebook stream is not always the easiest thing to do. All right, well, you can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. 
I want to take a moment to thank everyone who listens, watches, and reads our content. You are all awesome, and it's been great to see our audience slowly growing. Assuming you're all enjoying what we're doing here, we have a small favor to ask. Yeah, when you get a chance, please take a moment to leave a review for our podcast. You can do that on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, pretty much all of the major platforms have a way to drop a review. Leaving a review costs you nothing but time, but the more reviews we have, the better chance new gamers will find our show. And it would also be awesome if you would head over to our YouTube channel and hit that subscribe button. We've set ourselves up to our goal of getting to 500 YouTube subs before our two-year anniversary, and that's coming up quick. But we aren't quite there yet. We still need 55 more. All right, this, we have a con announcement. Not that we're going to have a lot of those this year, but we do have a con announcement. It is currently 36 days away from Gen Con Online. Now, last week, I actually took the time to check out the site and took a look at what they're doing and registered for a batch. So it is official. At least me, the tabletop bellhop, will be taking part in Gen Con Online. Now, note, we are just attending this con, not special guests or anything like that. I'm sure once the con is over, we'll do a wrap-up and review. So watch for that after the event. All right, just a note from our chat room. They would like our YouTube channel. So it's just youtube.com slash tabletop bellhop, all one word. All right. Um, we start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in the chat room, the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue after the show, after the double bell, with more chat and some content that otherwise only our patrons will get. All right, normally I would sit and chat with the chat room here for quite a while, but this is an AMA episode, so what we're going to do is jump into the next segment almost right away and start answering your questions live. What I will say is earlier we were talking about a couple things. We did have a bit of technical difficulty getting set up today, so I do apologize for that. I am having internet connectivity issues. It's been going on for about a week. I may have solved the problem, or we may have solved the problem. Uh, hopefully it's going pretty well. Um... Other than that, uh, we were talking about exclusives, uh, specifically target exclusives in regard to Gloomhaven. Uh, was Jaws of the Lion? Something of the Lion. I think it's Jaws of the Lion. And it ends up that right now, the only place you can get that is at Target in the U.S. Ex and please don't. People buy off scalpers. Like There's people charging $200 for this thing already. That's ridiculous. Just wait. Be patient. In August, the game comes out officially to all other retail stores. Um, you will be able to hear our opinion on it and see an unboxing video, but that's not going to happen until August. So I do have a copy coming uh, thanks to Tabletop Renaissance. And that's uh, the same company, a local game store, that provided me with a copy of Cthulhu Meth Death May Die. So shout out to Solon. Thank you for that. So uh, you will get my opinion on it. I've already been reading up on it. There are some changes from the original game. Uh, some of the interesting stuff is they've updated all the items based on the FAQ. So like the stamina potions in there actually say they are only like one use to like one less use than they say on the original cards. Uh, they have changed the rules for focus which supposedly is supposed to be simpler, but actually to me sounds more complicated. And the one I really want to see, but no one will tell me exactly what it is, they changed the line of sight rules, and I'm curious about that. Now, added to that is a much lighter game with simpler characters and no dungeon tiles or overlays. It's done in a book, like uh, Mice and Mist. No, Mice and Mystics with boards, like um, Stuff Fabled or Aftermath or um, there's a couple other games in that. So it's a book, a spiral book where you flip the page and the rules for the scenario on the left and the actual scenarios on the right. So definitely a much smaller box, more compact uh, price point. So I got to say, I'm looking forward to that, but that won't be happening here until August due to the target exclusivity. All right. And one other little note before we uh, jump into the Ask the Hop, uh, Math Guy Dave, one of our patrons, has just said that Days of Wonder has announced a pre-order availability for Small World of Warcraft a World yep. of Warcraft branded version of Small World. Yeah, that's been out for a while. The news on that's been out for mm -hmm. a while. Pre-orders must have just went live. I knew that one was coming. I don't know, maybe. I'm, I'm not a big WoW fan. Small World is a swallow game. All right, well, we're here to answer your game, game your game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. 
Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere. It's tabletop bellhop one word. Best way is for questions to come through the website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. It is the last Wednesday of the month, which means it's time for another live AMA where we answer questions from our chat room, the lobby, as well as a couple of questions people have sent in ahead of time. Thank you to our patrons and those people on Twitter and everywhere else who do get in touch with us who can't be here for the show. All right, there was something where to go. There was a question way earlier that I was like, we got to save this. Where did it go? So we do one of these live Q&As once a month to give our fans who join us live here on Twitch a chance to ask questions directly. Be sure to join us the last Wednesday of every month and be ready with your gaming and game night questions, or really, since it really isn't Ask Us Anything, it doesn't have to be gaming related. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, not, uh, not seeing any questions just I yet. Three questions in the chat already. Where are we seeing? I'm not. I'm not. Um, that's not so good. Well, will any of you be participating in the virtual gaming con this week? You know what? I looked into it. Uh, virtual game con costs 10 bucks to take part in, which just seems really odd when Gen Con online doesn't cost anything to take part in. Regany Con virtual didn't cost anything to take part in. Uh, plus, they're not. It, it's up to the people who are participating to set up their own events, including their own um, software. Like, so. I could go on there and I use tabletop events and go, I am going to run Raiders of the North Sea Friday at 8 PM. And then I have to decide what platform I have to then own. Like I had uh, tabletopia is the one they're pushing, but then I have to tell people to go on BGA. Like they're literally letting the guests determine what events are happening mixed in with official dice tower and board game geek events. So at first, I actually thought no one was, I'm like, this is a little nuts. Like, you're, like you're putting all the work on the fans, which seemed a little weird. But then I went there today, and today on Wednesday were 150 events, and I would say 75% of them were full. Mm. So people are definitely taking part. The weird part is it's not centralized. So, like, people are running games on Tabletopia, Tabletop Simulator, Board Game Arena, Bois de Joux. Like, people are playing games everywhere, just on Skype, just on Discord, using um what is that stupid software everyone's using for webcam stuff right now i can't zoom. remember the name of zoom zoom yes there's all kinds of zoom games now what there is is a central discord server and what they've done is set aside rooms and this feels very con like so if i had signed up and tried to run a game i would have been assigned a time and a date and a room and i would be in like bg06 and then the players would have to be in bg06 and then I would have to tell them all, you know, boot BGA, invite me as a friend. Okay, now we'll play type of thing, which is just it's it's oddly loose, I, I guess, is a way to the way to describe it. Now on Board Game Geeks homepage, they do have like a they call it the head stage where they're doing videos, but it wasn't what you'd expect from a head stage. Like when I went there, it was someone playing I forget what board game now, but some someone just playing something solo on Board Game Arena, and I'm like, well, that's your head stage, like, that's your premiere, hey, look what's going on, is someone playing a board game on solo? I, I don't know, I, it's, I, I find it very, very surprising they're charging in the first place. Now, you can get in free if you set up an event, so what I was going to do is I was going to run Terraforming Mars Saturday night at 8 p.m., which would have been 7 p.m. their time, for four players. Then I found out Skype's, or Steam's not supported. So they, they're not doing Steam events because, well, then people have to own Terraforming Mars on Steam, I guess. At the pay time and own Terraforming Mars on Steam. I don't know. The other thing that's really weird is I can get a ton of content for free. And I'm not sure if I should because, like, anyone can join the Discord channel. And you can go into all the exhibit halls and you can watch all the videos. I didn't pay 10 bucks. The only thing you can't do is actually sign up for a scheduled event. But then there's waiting rooms. So I could probably just join a waiting room going, I'm looking for a game. Now, I didn't do this. Like, that seems somewhat questionable. So I don't know. Uh, virtual game con, it's their first time doing it. It's obviously working. Like I said, 15 rooms at, like, full. And you got to think, at 10 bucks a head and four people per game, they're making some money off this. Well, probably not, though, because anyone who's set up a game is in for free. So most of the people yeah, there have people probably set up a game up games, in order to, yeah. to be there. Um, I, mean, I don't know, you know how many people are actually setting up games, though. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of them if there's that many games going on. Yeah. So. I don't know. I, like, I really don't know if uh, at how well it'll go. So the other thing was, if I had taken part in it, there wasn't enough notice. 
for this con. Like there was literally less than two weeks notice and we have a podcast, right? So everyone who's here live would have known about it. I would have been like, Hey, come play with the bellhop on Friday night or Saturday night. But that's it because our podcast doesn't come out by till Tuesday. And on Tuesday, the con's done. Right. Like there just wasn't enough time to promote the fact we'd be there. So I don't know. I, 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 I might, jump in something by the end of the weekend i probably won't um i don't know i we'll see <laughs> so interesting in the in the chat room evil john asks how would you improve this there really aren't online tools for managing virtual queuing or crowd management well i mean there's there's two solutions i would go with personally uh the first one would be to go the way renegade con is open it up yep. don't charge you're you're wasting your time in some ways uh, because there aren't centralized tools to manage this. Um, the other option, uh, which is a, a higher end option, but if you were going to charge, you'd have the ability, would be to use WebEx. Um, for those people who, not in, uh, who aren't aware, WebEx is a corporate um, Zoom solution, sort of, but it's got it's way more granule and there's way more control. Uh, so I could have four people playing a game, each with their own webcams, and then an entire other audience that was would let in if they had the password um, and control it that way. Um, so there are options in order to do that. Um, again, this week, all week long, I'm taking a workshop uh, from my company, uh, from a, a, a company I'm a dealer for, uh, or my, my, my employer is a dealer for, and I have to sign up for events. Um, they actually built a web app and, or, you know, you know, a cell phone app mm -hmm. and I sign up for events. And if I sign up for an event and I'm approved, they send me a link that goes into my Outlook calendar and it has a password that allows me to get in as a mm -hmm. participant. Um, and then the hosts have their own passwords to get in as hosts, or in this case, it would be, you know, as, as players. So I think that's somewhat what they're doing with tabletop events. So what Renegade did for queuing was you could buy event tickets. It was from Eventbrite, I think, was the site I had to go to but to buy tickets. Now, tickets were free. Like, you didn't have to pay for them, but I had to go through the process. Right. What those would do is guarantee you a spot at the table at a certain time. And they were also selling all the panels and stuff that I attended, but I didn't buy any. And the only reason they were actually doing that was to track numbers. And there was no way for them to require people to have them. This is the same problem that this con's having is all of the panels are like on places like Twitch, right? Or YouTube or Facebook live. And there's nothing, there's no way to limit. Like I, I think you can do member only chat or subscriber only chat type stuff. I don't think right. there's a way to stream on Twitch without it being public. As no, far as I no, know. you can lock down chat, but right. If you're you streaming, you're chat, streaming to everybody. Like, you're streaming, you're streaming, right? So you can't lock that down, right? So there's there's no way to prevent people from doing that. But what they did do that worked was every game. Now the thing is, Renegade Con small. You didn't have 150 games. You that you they only had six games. They were doing demos of. They had the game, and then they had the waiting room. And what you had to do was go into the waiting room, and there was a command. I don't remember what, but it was like bang play. You would put that in, and they had a bot in the thing that would put you in a queue. And then it would tell you approximately, like, you are number three in the queue, your game will be starting next, or you are number six in the queue, you will be the third game from now, or whatever. And that seemed to work really good. Now, I didn't actually do it, but, like, like Renegade had everything very centralized with the, the Discord, plus they very specifically said, you are using Tabletopia, or you're using Roll20. And they have partnerships with these people, so these companies are willing to work with these online game conventions. Now, one thing I did see for Virtual Gaming Con that's kind of cool is Tabletopia, again, worked with them. You get free access to every game on Tabletopia with your badge. So for $10, you can play all those premium games on Tabletopia until Sunday at midnight, right? which is kind of neat. But that's also their way of making it so that, like, I don't know, it just the whole con feels like, hey, we're here. Here's a hall. Do your thing. Yeah. And that kind of is what it is but then i looked at how many scheduled events there were and i'm like i guess it's working yeah no and i mean it's 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 interesting because i think the real problem i have is with it is the cost because yeah like it just you, if you're paying for something you need to get something different and i'm not really clear that's what's happening in this case um whereas you know if you were to go to the um and, and it's there's there's definitely some upfront uh cost and issues 
you know, you're setting setting up a web uh, a WebEx X system, and and you know you can have 160 viewers for you know without any problem. Um, but you need to you need to set that up and and be prepared well in advance for that kind of uh, infrastructure. Well, the other thing too, right? This is Board Game Geek in the Dice Tower. Like that is a huge fan base. Absolutely, like, that, is, that is a massive, massive fan base right well, there. And I'm sure a lot of them want to up, support. Right? Right there, there's a, there's a yeah. level of it's ten dollars and yes I could get around it but I want to support the Dice Tower and Board Game yeah. Geek so I will give them the ten dollars even though I could walk in the side door and not pay. Yeah, basically. So what the ten dollars does do, and and this I think is value added just because I looked at those hundred and fifty events. I didn't look at every event, but it was very clear it said buy next to the ones that had slots, and it was very clear that like seventy five percent were full. And you needed a ticket to be able to go into tabletop events and reserve. And as far as I can tell, there isn't what Renegade had. There's no virtual waiting room. There's no just get in line. If you want to play a game, you need. if you want to set up a game, you're supposed to register it. And for one, you get a free badge, which is cool. And two, if you want to play a game, you have to sign up. So it's unlike Renegade where you could just like basically stumble into a demo room. That's not happening here. Now, what I didn't see, what I did see too, is the number of sponsors was huge. Like there was a ridiculous number of companies that have rooms in their Discord. Right. Now, I clicked through those, and I realized it's only the first day, and I only went there earlier today at, like, 11 in the afternoon. So it's, like, really early, the first day of a con, and I didn't see anything value-added in any of those rooms. But then again, I felt guilty even looking at them because, again, I didn't buy a badge. Right. But then, I don't know, is it like walking into Origins, and, and you're hanging out in the hallway, and you just never go in the dealer room? Because you can do that without a badge at Origins. So I didn't feel guilty for doing that, but I don't know. Maybe, like maybe by the end of the weekend, it, it, it'll depend on my mood. Maybe Saturday I'll be bored and I'm like, you know what? Why not? I'm, I'm going to try out some games or I'll find something. The other problem was tabletop events is not a happy way to find events and search. Um, like when you go to Origins, you get this ridiculously like three inch thick book with all the events that are going on and it's crazy. And it, it feels like that. Like, yeah, it's only 15 pages, not a thousand. But I'm like, I don't even know how to find a game I'd want to play. Like, right. And that's and that's problematic. I mean, discovery is a, a huge issue in any con, whether it's a, whether yeah. it's Origins in person or online. Um, you you know, we've talked about this uh, in other episodes, even, you know, you, you why do you go to a con if your friends are the only ones playing? Um, yes. Now, if your friends are internet friends you know if i haven't seen danielle in two years because of a pandemic mm. i might want to get to a table get at a table with her because i never actually play with her even though i consider her my friend but you know if it's mo and d and sean hamilton who i don't see all the time but i can play a game with them more often than not when we're not yeah. locked down maybe i want to go somewhere else and play something with someone else that you know or or a game that you might not enjoy but catches my interest you know you like cthulhu but i want to go shoot i don't know something so play a military game where I, i'm sneaking right. around to, to sh you know kill russians i don't know something different that you might not be interested in that's some of the best part of uh, a con and if your discovery issue if you have discovery issues you're more likely going to fall back on that oh well what games are you in oh maybe i'll try that then rather than getting out there and finding that new game that you could love, but you didn't know about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think you're going to discover anything new at this kind of con. Now, again, Renegade was a little more specific because they had demos of their newest games, and they were promoting demos of their newest games. I don't think this, but but again, to be honest, Dice Tower Con and Board Game Geek Con are not cons to discover new games. Like the physical versions of those two cons are very much go and play games. Not, not big dealers. There's no demos. Games don't get released at them. They're not John Con. They're not Origins. They are game with your friends, game with new friends, game with people you only see once a year type of con. And I think they've actually kind of nailed it that way because that is definitely what this feels like. Right. So I don't know. Maybe I'll have more to say after the weekend's done. Um, but like I said, I do plan on checking out Gen Con online. It seems to be a bit more organized. Again, this just feels like here's a space. Do what you want with it. And I'm kind of confused by what it's being used for. Right. And I, I, I think it's awesome that the, the dealers have their own rooms. Because one of the things I can really see that useful for is if you're in a game and you get that question. Hey, I'm playing 
small world too. And what the heck does this mean? You can hop over to the discord channel and ask yeah. days of wonder what the heck you're supposed to do here. Like, and that's well, true in theory, that's the perfect place. You know, you've got yep. this, this real available resource for games and you know, days of wonder, whoever should be right there to jump in, to help people and yep. increase that engagement Very and true. that enjoyability of their games. That would be a perfect use for those dealer spaces. Uh, as well as so just, you know, selling too. stuff. <laughs> so here's another another difference between this and, and say Renegade Con. I don't know who's running any of these games. It could be anyone. And that is slightly worrying. Like if I show up to learn a new game, how do I know they're going to teach it right? Whereas when I went to a Renegade demo room, it was a Renegade staff member or volunteer who was taught the game by Renegade, who's excited about the game, who is hyped about Renegade, trying to teach Renegade's game, basically sell it to that's what i expect from a demo right. whereas if i show up to play joe's terraforming mars game and like I, who's joe right now there is a code of conduct that you have to agree to so thumbs up on that so i don't think you i i, I am hoping they're making it a safe space that's something that i'm sure will come out online in the next five days if it's not um they do have a very solid harassment policy and all of that. I, you have to read through all of that before creating an event. So I said I tried. I tried to. I thought I was going to do Terraforming Mars on Steam. I just. I, I don't know. I also thought of doing Clans of Caledonia on Board Game Arena, but then I thought about the fact of what if five people show up who have never played before. And I was like, oh man, how do I say experience? So I don't know. It might happen by the end of the weekend. But I am a little concerned that like you don't. But it's the same thing at Origins, right? Like or or Gen Con or any other con, you don't know the people you're gaming with until you game with them. Well, yes and no. I mean, at least with you, if you've got, you know, uh, a con book, um, there's usually information about, you know, a lot of those people, not necessarily every single uh, DM, but uh, a lot of the DMs will be in, you know, in case guests and things. And there's usually bios uh, available for there. Um, I don't know if they've got any bio space available in the DM section of each the thing is, like, it's like Origins. Anyone can sign up to run anything. So only the guests are going to have bios. Right. So I just dropped a link into the chat. This is the schedule of events. It's currently filtered to Wednesday, board games and card games. I'm assuming it's doing that. And at this point, let's see if it's even gotten bigger. Yeah, there's 16 pages now of just board games and card games. So yeah. you are looking at, like, they're numbered, right? The highest number I see right now is 796. And I'm sure it's higher than that. Right. But, like, here, Hive on Board Game Arena. I got to say, that's probably someone just trying to get a free ticket. Like, if you're going to play a quick game of Hive on Board Game Arena, like, come on, it's a two-player game that takes under five minutes. Yep. They set it for they set it for a one-hour time limit. So the info here is there is no board. The pieces are added to the playing area, thus creating the board. As more and more pieces are added, the game becomes a fight to see who can be the first to capture the queen bee. Not the best description of Hive I've ever read. Host, I'm not going to mention just in case it is someone new. <laughs> uh, event number, uh, what type? Three, two people, so they're not going to play. They're just going to watch, I guess. Uh, adult, 18 plus, so they only want Americans. Or Americans, sorry, that's <laughs> the next line. They only want adults. It's it's in America's Chicago time zone. It's at Wednesday tonight at 11 p.m. Um, it's going to last one hour. <laughs> no, it is not. a board <laughs> game. It is in room BG18, and there is going to be a voice channel and a text channel in Discord. And you can click. The links are right here, which is nice drop you right into the right room uh which system will be used board game arena and there's a link to board game arena and a link right to the game on board game arena and who's attending it is nick and zero waiting for tickets so i could sign up to play hive tonight or i could give the ticket to a friend but i must have a badge to purchase tickets so i can't sign up for this game ahead of time which is kind of cool now if i switch over to like there's miniatures there's party social games there's seminars there's even video games if I switch over to RPGs, this is this frightening part. There are four scheduled today. That's it. Wow. So this is very much Board Game Geek and the Dice Tower. There are right. only four RPGs. You have Changeling the Lost, Summer of the Meteor, Journey in the Old Kingdom, Maxim Apocalypse. So one of the problems is nowhere does it list what system these are. Right. So that's rough. It's and I also see two of the games were canceled. Yeah, well, I mean, the first, you know, I looked up here and my first problem is um you can't actually um look at more than however many games this ten. is in 10 games ten. at a time which yeah, is horrible I um i don't want to look through however many pages this are yeah. Should, let me let me expand a list to 500 
and I'll just scroll or sort um, by by whatever. But I mean, you know, game 313, double feature, which turns out to have been canceled, is a Google meeting playing, uh, you know, where you basically guess a movie name based off of a, car, a, ga- a card game that has 12 cards. Okay. It's, it's a, sure. you know, print and play pocket game. Um, you know, yeah. Well, again, I think some of these people have created events yeah. just to get in, right? Yep. Like, for example, I want to play Iron Edda with Tracy because Tracy is fantastic. There's no Iron Edda games. Dang. How about Hydro Hackers? No. Like, I, I, I don't know. How about if I just try typing Fate? So this is part of the problem. None of them say the game. Right. So I type Fate and I get Maximum Apocalypse RPG, get in the van, the hunt. So at least someone put the name of the game. So if I go under RPGs, like people aren't putting the name of the system in the title. So I don't even know, right? Like the, like RPG should be broken into D and D or fantasy. Yeah, what's it's interesting like if, if is, I there... if I search if I put all event types and then just yep. type RPG in capital letters into the search, I get three events, two of which are canceled. Yeah, all days. Yeah, to, well, games, that's that's supposedly... just this. That's today, I guess, but uh, okay. Wednesday. But if I do all okay. days, what do I get here? I get two pages. So huh. you know, that's eighteen. But what games are they, right? Like, they're all just yeah. titles. Yeah. Like, having to find it. like, And then war games. Like, war gaming is a big deal. I don't know how well war gaming works online. All weekend, there were less than 10 war games going on. Like, it's just, right. I don't know. But then you go to board games, and there are pages and pages and pages. Which is understandable, given the, you know. The, the, who it is, who right? It is. Yeah. Let's see. If I want to play Terraforming Mars this weekend. Oh, let's see. This is cool. This is why. it's You can play Terraforming Mars with Conacor. Right. That that's cool. As the owner of indie boards and responsible for publishing Terraforming Mars, so they are getting the big big names. Right. Which I'm, I am tempted. Two hours. How are you going to play Terraforming Mars for only two hours? And where are you going to play it? Is Ooh. it on um, Terraforming on? Mars Deathmatch? What when are they using? Discord voice and video meet in the Stronghold Games voice booth, and we can speak on audio and or see each other on video. Again, ensure you have Terraforming Mars Digital installed on your device so you know my Asmodee Digital ID. So here he is running it on Steam when I found he couldn't run on Steam. Right. So Steam or Tabletop. Wednesday at 11 a.m. But I, how are you going to finish a game of Terraforming Mars in four hours? Well, they have two a three-hour three, they they have a three hour duration Terraforming Mars deathmatch on the main stage on Sunday morning, See, which is... Sounds- uh, bueno core versus board game geek versus dice tower and they're doing a head to head head to head see that's uh, cool you know big you know family match sort of thing so yeah i could have i could have signed up to play it on steam because it must have terraforming mars installed on steam ios or android what's right. weird is it said there was still room available this says five people are waiting for tickets so that's if people back out like mm-hmm. i can admit i like tabletop events it's what um we uh the one that was in toronto had i'm drawing a blank on the name of it. breakout con breakout use con. this piece of software I don't know. I've hey, had, right, enough I had issues this. with it. <laughs> I had issues we, with we, it. We but, are you know, spending too much time talking about virtual gaming con. That, the problem with this is this is ever evergreen. No one's going to care about this next week. <laughs> well, you know what, though? No, it's, I, I would say it is evergreen because con management, whether it's digital yes, or okay. in person, is an important thing. Uh, and no, no, we've this been to part cons. of the conversation where we're talking about what games are being well, played yes. on what days and how many <laughs> yeah. events. Terraforming, no, terraforming our, 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 our Mars. Talk about what, what's our solution and what you can do and using Discord to queue up. That's all great. But talking about what specific events are happening at a con that's already going to be dead by the time people listen to this probably isn't yeah, very no, useful. Probably not. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, yeah. And Deanna, Deanna mentioned she fears yeah. the quality based on folks wanting free tickets. And that's that was kind of my point. I'm, I, I, like, I don't know. I... I try to think the best of people i'm kind of it's difficult nowadays <laughs> so no, I, I worry there there's, there would be some uh not great games being run yeah and that's and that's going to be something you run into every time you start giving away free entry for doing anything you know if you yeah. you know hey come and vol you know maybe whatever. maybe that was the solution to get people to make events and they're worried they wouldn't have enough events so by charging and giving it a free this way they end up with thousands of events i don't know I, possibly i don't know all right well 
moving on, I got one question from one of our Patreons earlier on. If you guys want to jump in with other uh, questions in the chat room, we'll get to those. But uh, we're going back to a uh, patron question. Uh, patron of the show, Google, asks, are you currently or thinking of designing any games or RPGs or any future plans to develop games or RPGs? All right, so I don't know how many people know it. I have written a few RPGs. They are out there in the wild. Um, what I probably should do is uh, get them on like Drive Through RPG or Itch.io or something like that. Right now, they are just on RPG Geek. They are available 100% free. Uh, you can find them on my publisher page. So I think on Board Geek, I'm under Maurice Tuzano instead of Mo Tuzano. Uh, unfortunately, this drives me nuts. Okay, here, side complaint about Board Game Geek. I so want to change my username to Tabletop Bellhop, and they won't let me. I am stuck with my old username of Gilvin Blight, or I can make a new account under tabletop bellhop but then i lose all my logged plays and all my board game collection and everything so chad are you listening chad can you help us <laughs> no they, they won't no? they, they have okay. once made one exception they have made one exception uh so that's my board game geek username but i do have like an rpg designer page i am i can literally legally say i am a published award-winning rpg game designer um one of my games i'm i'm I, what's we're proud of not that i hate the other ones <laughs> one i think is neat because no one else has done it before this goes back to the steve jackson games because i'd never heard of the fantasy trip and i named my game a fantasy trip and it is a game you play when on a road trip and the main mechanic is i spy well and it's a fantasy rpg like dwarves elves fighting orcs and the the, the actual conflict mechanism uses i spy and it's meant to be played on a road trip when and specifically when driving to a con because this was written at con season and people have played it and i've gotten positive reviews uh the one i'm most excited about though is actually uh about playing small heroes and the the existing title is the diminutive rpg uh was inspired because arietti the movie had just came out which gave me huge flashbacks to watching the borrowers and Wanting an RPG that played in that setting. So your Tom Thumb, your Thumbelina, as well as your Rats of Nim, like anything small. And the point was small heroes, big problems. And that one I'm actually really proud of. I've gotten some really good feedback from members of the Gauntlet community before the Gauntlet community exists. Um, Lowell Francis, who's now known as Lowell Francis of the Gauntlet, um, said it was one of the, the best games that tied mechanics to the theme because it was all about smaller dice are better, and he was trying to reduce your dice pool, and the entire game is basically better. So I have... Uh, what I should do is fix that. So I did do a rewrite of it, because it was written in 24 hours. I did do a rewrite and publish that on Board Game Geek that made it a little better, but like I should sit down and write it. I should convert it to a notepad file and send it to an editor, because, well, I wrote it in Word, and... Man, if you move a single letter, you lose all the formatting, and it's oh, terrible. <laughs> because I did this thing where I used the like illuminated manuscript thing where the, the first letter of every paragraph was bigger, and it looked good. But, man, it, if you try to change that letter, you'd spend half an hour just trying to fix your Word document because you shouldn't write RPGs in Word. No, but you can write them in Word, but don't hey, format them. Not, not a lay, it's not layout software. <laughs> no. Oh, not no, at all. Not. My God. I, I fought with that so much. Like, like I probably wrote the game in half an hour and then spent 23 and a half hours trying to lay it out. Um, so, yeah, I have written games in the past. As for doing it again in the future, probably, I don't know, not, no big rush to. Um, I think I'd rather go sit down and refine those games and make them better. Now, there's other ones. There's, um, there is, uh, I, I wrote one that I, I joined the Iron Chef, Game Chef, sorry, not Iron Chef, Game Chef Competition. And got so insulted by the reviewers of my game that I'll never take part in that again. Um, I was told my designs were words I can't say on the air. Um, so that I won't take part on. But that is published. It's um, what did I, I think I called it Polarity is the name of the game. And yes, the basic mechanic didn't actually work. But you had to design it in a ridiculously short amount of time. And it sounded like it worked. But it had to do with adding dice to top or bottom of something. So to a negative or a, or a positive space. But I didn't think about well enough to realize the math was the same so like adding a minus on the bottom was the same as adding a plus on the top so so i get it the game didn't work but I, the way i was told my game didn't work was insulting enough so i plan on never ever even booting that pdf again i don't even want to look at that game i find that one traumatic um 
I wrote a game called Ego, where you are playing the magic item of the character to your right, and then you have Ego, so like you are a magic sword or a magic axe, and it's actually the will to try to take over the player. And if you win, you take over the players. You become the dominant ego. That one won an award. Uh, mechanics were so-so, but the concept I thought was really cool. Now, that's all on the RPG side. I, I Again, I, I doubt I'm going to come up with anything new. What I should do, I just don't have the time. Like, I don't even have the 24 hours. Like, it's just it's surprising. Like, you wouldn't think, a yeah, board game reviewer who writes about games and talks about games all day is busy. Trust me, I am. Now, most of it's trying to make money on affiliate sales, but still. It it's, keeps the kids fed and lets me do this full time. Uh, what I should do is start trying to take part in stuff like the 24-hour RPG contests and stuff like that and get back into designing that way. Now, on the board game side of things, up until recently, I had zero interest. Once I had a concept, someone's done it now, so I no longer need it. Uh, when Dominion was first popular and Trains came out, was uh, deck building was huge. Everyone loved deck building, and I wanted to do a deck deconstruction game. Because one of the most fun parts of playing a deck builder to me was thinning your deck, getting it down to that, like, every round I pick up the same five cards and do a ridiculous amount of damage, and the next round I pick them up again and hit you with them again. That was my mo the most fun I ever had playing a deck builder, specifically Star Realms. If you can get a Star Realms deck down to five cards that all just do damage, it's fantastic. So I wanted to make a deck deconstruction game where you started off with, say, a 120-card deck, and your opponent had a 120-card deck, and it was filled with garbage. And the goal was to streamline your deck as much as possible. And the first person to, uh, whatever, get their deck down to 30 cards or whatever. I, I, I didn't, I just had that concept that I wanted a deck deconstruction game. And that exists now. I am totally blanking on the game. It has to do with mining asteroids. I haven't played it. I don't know how well it worked. I can't remember the name of it. It might come to me. So once that came out, I was like, all right, someone did it. I don't, I don't need to, I don't need to do it. Someone else did it for me. But I don't know how many weeks ago it was now, but since being in quarantine, uh, Deanna and I tend to probably every other Friday or so, we like to have a night away from the kids. The like, kids are still here, but they, they leave us alone. They let us sleep in in the morning. They get to watch Netflix all day. And we have a late night and we usually enjoy a few craft beers because we found uh, Heads Up Ontario people. There's a place called Brewer Eats that will deliver you local craft beer. So we get craft beer from Brewer Eats or other local places. And we play some, uh, we usually start with a heavy game. We usually play something heavy and then slowly reduce it to sillier games going on later on through the night. And one of the games we've been playing during this, early in the night actually, is Unlabeled, the blind beer tasting game. Now, this is a game I kickstarted. I don't remember what year now, 20, a long time ago, actually. As 17 far as or 18. Concerned. Yeah, it was, it was a while ago as far as Kickstarter is concerned. Yeah. One, one of the earlier games I kickstarted. And I got this game, and it's okay. Like, it, it, it's neat. It gives you something to do while you're drinking beer, which is fun. I already rate beers. I Every beer I have, I open up an app, and I go on the app, and I talk about the different, you know, the, the taste and the, how carbonated it is and the aftertaste, and I give it a review. So I'm already doing this, right? So now I have a board game where I could add to that guessing what beer it is. And it's fun enough. It's all right. It's kind of fun. Like I said, it's one of those, if you're drinking beer anyway, why not do it? And it's a lot of fun with two people, but the rules as written just weren't that good. They, they were basically a push your luck game where if you didn't know your beer, like great, you just get no points almost all the time, or you wouldn't push your luck. So we made up house rules for it. We've now made up so many house rules for it that I don't even know if you consider it the same game. Like the, the basic premise is still the same. And the other problem is, I don't know, like, I guess we found out they're from Michigan, but obviously the people who drink beer in that part of Michigan don't have the same taste as the people in Windsor, Ontario, at least, or my friend from Edmonton who rates beer, because, like, they don't even have IBUs, and I don't know anyone who's considered a beer snob that doesn't care about IBUs. Like, you should be betting on IBUs. Plus, there are a ton of beer styles that just aren't accounted for on the board. And it's odd to me, like there's no chocolate stout on the board at all, or chocolate porter, or and and like what, there's not even like a specialty stout that would account for it. Well, I've strongly been considering remaking this game and possibly reaching out to that app that I talked to 
that I use to rate my beer and seeing if they'll license it. Like I strongly considering it because I think I can do a better job. So I, I guess that's possibly slightly insulting to the makers of Unlabeled. But you know what? I've talked about your game so much that people are starting to buy it because they see it on Twitter. And then I tell them what game it is and I see people buying it through my affiliate links. And uh, I, like, I know I've sold some copies of Unlabeled. Which it's good. It's not terrible. It just it could be better. And I feel like I could we could do it. We could somehow market it. But I know nothing about publishing games. Like I I don't know. I, I think I'd have to pitch it to someone and I don't know what board game publisher would publish a game about beer. Now Stephen Bonacore of Stronghold Games is a huge beer fan, so maybe, but I don't think it really fits his indie boards and cards company. Like I think he might dig the game, but Plus, I, I have zero published credits. <laughs> now, I am not a designer, nor do I play one on TV, uh, nor do I pretend to be one here on the show. Uh, but I have to say, you talking about your concept for a the RPG where you are the magic item with ego taking yeah. over top of, I want a board game. Because I think a board yeah. game is better than RPG, where you are playing a magical item in a magic store. And your goal is to be the item that is purchased by the adventurer coming in. I think. <laughs> you think it's already out there. Ah, it's uh, something similar. But, there but, is, oh, what is it called? Oh, it's based on reality TV show. The, the, oh, I'm drawing a blank. This is terrible. My brain is not in the right place for so, an AMA tonight. The deconstruction card game that we were talking about, while Mo thinks about uh, that, it was a Xenon Profiteer. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah was was uh, for, for a significant period of time, one of the only uh, card yes. deconstruction games out there. There are apparently uh, others since, but... Uh, uh, See, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, Fine Sand, I believe, is is a newer oh, deck a deconstruction. Fruits. So that that's the um the designer yeah. of Power Grid. Yeah. So that right, is another deck quest. deconstruction. Bargain, Bargain quest, quest is okay. the game I'm thinking of, but you don't play the item. But what it is is you are the medieval shopkeeper. You're the you're the D, you're the you're the the magic item shop in D and D. Right. And you are trying to lure the adventurers to your shop instead of your opponent's shops. Okay. So it's not you're trying to be the one item that gets bought, but you're the shop you want people to shop at. So I think it, yeah. it could be a re Sim similar. Yeah, yeah. Quest. But I could, but I can definitely th see you know like you, you know you've got the the magic sword, singing sword versus the the yep. the bloodthirsty axe. Uh, you know, competing oh, we for. We could totally do it as a, a but wait, there's more. Oh, there. Oh, hey. It, it could yeah. be a pitch game. We could. It yes. It could be a pitch game. <laughs> you get a whole deck of different magic items. You have a deck of personality types and yeah. a deck of quirks or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. we've got some real possibility here. That, that's got uh, some real possibility. We, we may have a print and play <laughs> deck <laughs> builder. Um, so there we go. Yes, apparently we do think of designing any games, yes. RPGs, but Mo is already a published yes. and award winning yes. RPG designer. I realize it sounds like I'm bragging, but you know what? Someone a long time ago had this thread about, um, what's that term? Oh my God, my brain tonight. Imposter syndrome. And was going through about self-validation and was like, are you a real publisher? Are you a real designer? Are you this? And they had a list that basically went, has this happened? 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 And you actually got badges for it, which were pretty cool. And at the time, this was Google+. Plus. I used to have those badges at the top of my profile because I was an award-winning published game designer were the three awards that I qualified for because I won the RPG Geek 24 RPG contest back-to-back -back two years in a row, right. um, which was not with Diminutive RPG. It was with Ego and uh, Fantasy Trip, which I need to rename. It's going to be like Fantasy Road Trip or something because I now know there is a RPG called Fantasy Trip, which actually just been reprinted, so it's even worse now. <laughs> and one of the people who wrote into the show thinks it's a better tactical game than D&D, &D, so fair enough. All right. Um... Not a lot of questions in the... Uh... So we do have this one that is from someone in the chat. Uh, oh, there we go. So, uh, yes, no, absolutely. Uh, so in the chat, but also in uh, one of our patrons, patron show Math Guy Dave asked us earlier on, if you magically had a group that was guaranteed to meet weekly and play a game of your choice for the next year, year. what board game or RPG 
would you play? And we're assuming that the pandemic is over at this point. So yeah, we, can, so. we can ignore the, uh, the social distancing concerns we have at this particular moment. All right. One year exactly. I think we should give an answer for both. I think you should answer this too. Why not? Um, for RPGs, for one year, I really want to say DCC, but because it's limited to one year, I am going to go with Shadow of the Demon Lord. Because Shadow of the Demon Lord, you literally only play... Oh, you know what, though? If you're playing every week, I think you might get through it too quick. <laughs> I think it was, so Shadow of the Demon Lord, uh, you play through levels 1 to 10 and tell a complete story and then it's done. I don't know if that would last a year if you were meeting every week, though. Because I don't know if you level up every session. So, like, I don't know if it would take 52 sessions to get to level 10. Right. So, no, I'm going to switch back. I'm going to go back to DCC then. At first, I was thinking Shadow of the Demon Lord, but you know what? You you might do that whole arc too quickly if you actually met every week for a year. If you had 52 gaming sessions in, I don't think you want to do 50 or five Shadows of the Demon Lord campaigns. Yeah, and John so is I'm, saying I'm you, definitely, you definitely uh, exceed. Did you level up <laughs> yeah, every yeah. time? Yeah, see, I, I thought so. I read it. It's been a long time since I've read Shadows of the Demon Lord. I've got a review posted on the blog. It's actually um, Robert Schwab actually really liked it and has a link to it on his webpage, which is awesome. But I haven't played it yet. So 10 um, sessions is what you get. Yeah, you get 10 sessions. Yeah, see, 10 sessions is not going to last. I don't want to play it five times. Yep. So I'm going to switch back over to Dungeon Crawl Classics. Um, I have been really, again, no, I think about it. You know, it's an AMA when I'm like changing my mind <laughs> mid sentence. Or your characters aren't going to live long enough in DCC to play through 52 sessions. Like you're gonna you're gonna get I don't know how many sessions, maybe not even 10. And then unless you just keep making new characters, which is part of it. No, I'm gonna stick with. It. I, I really want to run DCC. I want to play DCC. Um, I like D and D, but I don't like all of D and D's mechanics. I there's there's a lot I like about D and D, and the main thing that draws me to Dungeons and Dragons is the tropes, the the aesthetic, the 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 things that everyone knows. When you sit down at a table, you're playing D&D, what to expect as far as the different races, the different settings, the the magic level, the the fact you're going to be heroes, the alignments, the gods. There's a certain feel to the D&D games. DCC gives me all of that with a system that to me sounds more interesting. So that's why I want to run it. You get that familiarity of playing your traditional fantasy RPG with the really cool mechanics of the dice and the sliding dice pool and luck and the crazy tables for the spells and corrupting magic, which I think is just a carryover for me from Warhammer that I really like magic that corrupts. That's just something that I like in my games. So yeah, I think Dungeon Crawl Classics is is my final answer. Um the other the other option would be Star Wars from Fantasy Flight Games. One of them it would probably be um the 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 original one, the Shadow Wow, Edge of the Empire. The original one where you're playing like basically scoundrels. Right. Although I do own all three books, so even for a year I could probably mesh in all the other character classes. Yeah, for me it's tough. I mean, uh I think in a perfect world, um I'd probably play at a table of yours every week for a year, year, but that's not really an option. Uh, for me, it would almost certainly have to be digital, no matter what it was. Uh, just no, I think uh, just throw that away if you could play but, anything. But I mean, we're really, throwing away the pandemic. We may as well throw we away the Fair whole enough. distance problem. Uh, I have to say, I am really. I got you know, I got involved in a mask game at the end of last yep. year, uh, and unfortunately, it kind of fell apart. Uh, but I would love to get into a solid group and just dig into masks and, uh, you know, sort of delve deeper into the PBTA mechanics. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I really enjoy superhero play and, and that one has really caught my interest. Um, the only part I don't love about masks is it's very, uh, teen oriented. Like the, the concept oh, yeah. of masks is you are mm -hmm. teenage superheroes um but i'm okay with that I, I would prefer not but i can deal i'm a big boy uh so is mass suited to long-term play because i know a lot of pbta games are best suited to short story arcs because they don't have enough pr character progression or changing um nah, again i haven't i haven't played enough of it, enough of it for yeah, long okay. enough to really know um the the whole fail forward thing could conceivably be a problem 
But if you know you're playing for a whole year, you dial back yeah. the you dial back that progression. I mean, there's no reason you couldn't um, you know mechanically just hit the brakes on that and 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 it would it would and because it's a superhero game episodic works right so you can do yeah. a series of short arcs mm-hmm. um and as long as you're you're controlling the speed of that upgrade so that you are so that you aren't gonna you know peak out until that last month of the year uh and and that's when you throw thanos in or what you know you know the big yeah. bad that that needs fully maxed out uh characters oh totally fair so sticking with RPGs, just looking through the chat, keep them involved here. I see uh, Deanna would like to play 5th edition d and I think she'd rather play, if she's going to play every week for your 2nd edition Advanced Dungeons & Dragons with skills and powers and combat and tactics, I think is probably a better answer for her. If you had like the, the imaginary group that would show up and play whatever you wanted. Uh, but yeah, D&D. Um, Evil John noted they ran Horde of the Dragon Queen for over 40 plus sessions. Wow. Uh, Ryan, that's one I considered. Red Maple Ryan saying Star Trek Adventures with a year-long story arc. I would love to run a Star Trek game again. The only Star Trek game I have is FASA, and we only played it once. Like, Sean came down from Toronto at the time to play in that Star Trek game, and it was awesome just because, just like I like D&D, everyone knew the tropes. Like, everyone just was able to play Star Trek. Everyone knows what Star Trek is. Everyone knows the techno babble and stuff like that, and everyone just, like, piled in on that. And it was so much fun. So, yeah, it would be totally up for doing Star Trek. But I'd have to find a system. Well, I guess I could run it in that old system. What I would like you to try is this is always how every show we start talking about this stuff. I come up with some game Sean has to play when he comes to Windsor. You have to try the Marvel Heroic Role Playing from Margaret Weas production sometime. Yes. That is such a fantastic system. I love it. I hate the fact that it they lost the license because, man, that was good. Now, they are the company that put out Sentinel Comics. Right. So that would be the compromise, would be to play Sentinel Comics, except they don't own it. Right. So there's that problem. All right, moving on to board games. Uh, the problem, like, I'm spoiled here. We have this, uh, except for the quarantine, that'd be Gloomhaven. Right? Like, what game? If I had to play one game, right? Like, one game for the rest of the year every week would be getting back to playing Gloomhaven with Tori and Kat. Like, I, I would, that's what we should be doing now. <laughs> and I would love to actually finish Gloomhaven and then maybe try Draws of the Lion. Uh, instead of playing it as a separate game. Though I am looking forward to Jaws of the Lion looks a lot more approachable. So I think it's going to be good for um, like bringing, uh, that's something I think I could bring to the local game store once the pandemic's over and play with people there as opposed to needing the same group. But we'll see when it comes out. But I would love to finish our Gloomhaven game. Like uh, that is literally, should be happening now. We are playing Gloomhaven Friday night at 8.30 Eastern, except there's a pandemic. And unfortunately, Cat is a frontline worker in the medical field. So, uh, like, I don't know when we'll be able to have her over. Like, she's about as high risk as you get. So it, it may be some time, like, before we're able to get that going again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and honestly, for board games, um, I wouldn't even know where to start. I mean, I don't play long-term board games. Uh, it's not something yeah. I've ever really delved into. Um uh i i do play uh i have uh 14 <laughs> games going right now that i play every day and most of them we play over and over and over again um so yeah it's it's i've got bga for that so that that that's my yeah. uh i already do that <laughs> i gotta admit it would have to be a campaign game like i wouldn't want to play terraforming mars 52 weeks in a row or go cuckoo or azul or any standard board game it would have to be something with some kind of campaign element or legacy legacy element like if, if i had to pick something like right now that wasn't gloomy with tori and cat i don't know if it's long enough but i think clank legacy I'm, i've been hearing fantastic things about that game i just don't know if there's 52 sessions in that box whereas gloomhaven there is so i don't know if it's big enough um at all so uh, Red Meeple Ryan does have a question that ties into this. I want to know if we're going to have weekly plays of Giant Jaws of the Lion starting in August. And to be honest, we might. Because, we again, we probably won't be getting back to our main Gloomhaven campaign. Uh, maybe Deanna and I will two-player Jaws of the Lion, and that'll replace our Gloomhaven streams. Because we do have fans out there who are missing our Gloomhaven streams, which just kind of feels awesome. 
But I also miss it. Although it's going to cut into Friday night date night. I'm going to have to move date night to Saturdays. <laughs> I, I, I need my meat and cheese and beer and unlabeled and complaining about unlabeled because beers aren't on it. So uh, Ryan's also bringing up uh, role player, uh, role player adventures, R O L L yes. player adventures, uh, which is live right now on Kickstarter, which is a one to four player cooperative storytelling board game. I am curious about that one. I love role player. Role player is a fantastic dice drafting game. Um, it's Thunderworks game. That is a game that if origins was happening i would have hoped to have brought home <laughs> fortunately it's not it does look good i'm probably not going to back the kickstarter at this point i'll probably wait until it hits retail yeah unfortunately but, um even though it does have a solar option that's a little on the pricey side for me uh it starts yes. at 100 bucks uh yeah, the basic cheap. basic uh uh intro there is 100 bucks so that's that's scary See, the goal the goal of it is so when role player came out it was designed with the theory that enough people out there think that the most fun part of D&D, I'm going to use D&D as a generic because it's fantasy races, the most fun is making characters. So they made a board game about making and optimizing D&D characters, basically. And it even has like strength, dex, con, and whatever. And you roll 3D6. Like it's it's very much based on D&D characters. But then a bunch of people complained and went, well, now I have this character. I want to do something with it. So they put out an expansion where you then do the next step and you fight a few monsters. And I got to admit, I haven't tried that. I, I haven't tried the expansion. Well, then they went to the next step and went, now you're going to make your character a role player and you're going to be able to bring it into role player adventures and play an adventure. Now, I don't know how much of an RPG board game it is. I'll admit, I haven't dug into it that much. I did see it went live. I clicked through it. I looked through it, went, ooh, that's quite the price point. Then went, oh, wish I was at Origins because Tim Verming, uh, Verling, I'm sorry, I'm pronouncing your last name wrong, Tim, is uh, one of the representatives from Thunderworks game that I get along with really well. And I think I would have been able to convince him to let me bring a copy home if they had any. Uh, if not, I would have got at least a role player expansion <laughs> to bring home and try. Yeah, so I mean, it you're getting cool. you're getting a lot. You're getting twelve adventure books, six double sided adventure maps, uh, oh. journals, character sheets, tokens, markers, pads of uh, stuff, cards, um, dice bags. It's I mean, yeah. you're getting a lot. So I mean, it's not that it's not worth a hundred dollars. That's just a lot yeah, of money for me to drop on a board right. game right now. That's that's all. It's uh you you are you are definitely getting your money's worth there, uh I think without a question, so, uh and I did like our uh, role player. Ro uh, Deanna taught me role player at uh yeah. Bre at break or not breakout con at uh, Q QCC. QCC. Yeah, it's um, solid. It's, yeah, no, it's a very it's solid a game. game. Um, All right, are we gonna end this? Or are we gonna do one last question? Uh, well, that one last question is one heck of a question. So that might and that that might actually be almost an episode on its own if we if we really jump into that that particular yeah, question. It depends how much we go too deep into it. That's the problem. Yeah, I don't know how. All right. So I I think we'll give the we'll give the chat room one more chance. I got to remember to save this question then to throw into next week's. So it's it's just a, we get we got a feedback on one of yeah. our one of our things that asked for some recommendations. And I was saving that just in case we didn't get any questions, but I it's awesome that we did get questions from the chat room tonight. So I cannot complain at all. No, no, absolutely not. Um, no, thank you everyone for the questions. You do have a chance to give us anything else. Uh, yeah, we spent too much long, too much time talking about B, not BGG con virtual gaming convention. Wasn't that, isn't that what it's called? Yeah. And yes. Yeah. Virtual gaming. BGC. Con. BGC. BGC. But realistically, and again, I mean, other than then when we drifted off into that, uh, terrible yeah. Mars discussion at the end, uh, I think there's some 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 good insights into managing cons. Yep. No, I get it. That is why we we took it, and plus we were, yep. we had a little bit of a late start tonight, but we have still quite a bit to get through. So. Yep. No, that's fine. Ryan is saying, "Don't <laughs> blame you. Can blame me. I always seem to manage to ask a question that generates a big ramble. That's what we want. Actually, this is a goal that we've set. I don't know if people have noticed it." But my goal for the AMA is now is to get like two to three, like three to four, somewhere like three really solid questions that we can really dive into. Because yeah. one of the problems in the past is we talked about so many things that I'm like, hey, tune into our show where we talk about Minotaur milk and gold coins and how how our favorite games, our least favorite games, Kickstarter expectations, the first games we backed, our favorite coffees. Like it was just too much, yeah. right? It was 
I'd rather get some nice deep yep. questions we can actually sit and talk about. A so. deep a deep dive on four three or four topics is is yes. really kind of ideal. We do want all the questions, and if we do a que- if we have a, an episode where we do forty questions, it's not the end of the world. But no. it is nice to to dig in and get into some meat of stuff, and I think that uh, that con one was a good example of that. Yes, we we had a, we did. If you go back yeah. to our first AMA, I, I think believe it was, it was our first on. AMA. Someone on Twitter asked uh, asked about Minotaur milk, and uh, we had a discussion about it. See, forty questions. If we did forty, I would totally do it. But it would be an entire episode on forty questions. We wouldn't have a review. We wouldn't have anything else. We'll just answer forty questions quickly. They can be like yes, no, favorite game, and you just say one thing. I totally do that. All right. Well, that's it for this month's AMA. Remember, we do one of these every month on the last Wednesday of the month. Be sure to join us next week when we'll be back to answering questions from our mailbag. Up next, a preview of the latest Valeria game soon to launch on Kickstarter from Daily Magic Games. All right, first of all, you've got to be aware that this is a preview, not a review. The reason I clarify that is that over the last few weeks, I have been playing a prototype copy of Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria that Daily Magic Games was awesome enough to let me check out. Now, because it's a prototype, there is a chance, I would say 100% chance, that the final project will be different in some way from what I'm reviewing here. Because I'm told at this point the rulebook is 80% complete, the artwork is pretty much final, Now, David's my contact at Daily Magic Games has let me know that since sending out the prototypes, they have been doing a lot of playtesting and they've been getting feedback from people like me who have been um, playing the game to review it, have let them know some issues. So they have made some changes that have made the gameplay tighter and more enjoyable, but without changing the overall, like the big mechanics. Uh, For example, when we get to the game, this will make more sense, but they have changed it so that the award tiles make sure that there's different types of awards up every game. And then uh, there was one other change that I know happened for sure. And I'm forgetting off the top of my head. It was something I suggested and like, Oh, we did that already. And I'm like, Oh, awesome. Um, and in solo play, there's now a thing where you recycle the champions that are in play. So they have made some changes. So just so you know, this is not the final game. This is the prototype. Now, Shadow Kings of Valeria is scheduled to go live on Kickstarter right now. It's scheduled for July the 7th. That looks like it's going to be a good date. I have gotten to see a preview of the Kickstarter page, and I got to say it looks good. I think people are going to be excited about this. The price point looks right. Um, they're doing an interesting thing with no no stretch goals, and they do have some interesting Kickstarter exclusives that are going to be there as well. Well, since all we have is a prototype of Shadow Kingdoms, we did not record an unboxing video so as not to confuse people with components that may not represent those from the final product. Now, I do have to say, for a prototype, this looked good. Like, it looked really good. It almost looked like a complete game. Like, I've had a few prototypes that I've done reviews on in the past. Um, Most recently, I think Builders of Blankenberg Expansion Fields and Flocks. And, like, that didn't even have all the art. I had a lot of cards with just words on them and stuff like that for that game. And I had like meeple painted different colors and that. So like, like we got these awesome monster meeples that came with it that I'm like, I want to keep these. They're awesome. And they have nothing to do with what's going to be in the final thing, but they're really cool. Little monster meeples. I, I think they're from, um, oh, I forget the name of the company. Meeple source, I think is who makes these monster meeples. So it was a nice touch to throw those in there and everything has art on it um so the meeples are definitely changing now as far as i know the art is going to be the same and the art is of course by the miko uh the miko knocked it out of the park i gotta say with this game like i'm always a fan of the miko stuff and this looks really good now this is not just the art of the cards but the layout of the board the iconography where everything is just looks great with lots of slavering hordes and baddies all over the artwork not that you're a fanboy or anything, but it's really hard to fault you for or that, given the quality turns out on all of his game projects. All right. Now, the reason there's monsters everywhere in this art is because this particular Valeria game, instead of playing the heroes, you are playing the monsters who are raiding the kingdoms of Valeria. A sharp about face from previous Valeria games. Yes. So to start off the game, a uh, player is going to pick one of the five monstrous hordes, the five armies to play. Uh, they're going to take a player board for that race. They're going to pick one of five two-sided campaign map boards. Um, they're going to pick one of the two sides. 
Uh, the player boards are going to have a place to track influence, gold, and magic, the three resources of the game. There are also spots to put dice and gems. And then there's indicators that show where you're going to place cards you collect during the game. Players are going to take 10 victory markers uh, in the prototype. These are just like basically tiddlywinks. And they're going to use these to cover up parts of the player board. Now, these are things that you're going to be able to unlock as the game goes on, but start the game blocked off. So, different races on player boards, covering up things on your board to be revealed as you play. Is this game like Terra Mystica? <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's more like Kinds of Caldonian. <laughs> so, anyway, <sighs> the center board consists of a scoring track surrounding five different areas they call shrines. Um, there are also spots to put three rows of champion cards and a row of battle plans and a set of three award cards. Now, decks of each of these are shuffled and the appropriate number of cards are laid out at the start of the game. You draw a number of dice from the bag that are rolled and placed on each shrine. This is based on the number of players. For example, in a three-player game, you are going to put out five at the beginning of the game. Now, the dice come in five colors and these match each of the five armies. They're numbered one to six, which represents the strength on the die, but they also have a bit of additional information. So there's the strength, which is the biggest value, makes it look like a normal die, but then there's also an army type. Now, the army type's determined by the die color, but they also throw a symbol on there, and that's for um, color blindness reasons. So if you can't tell the colors apart, you can read the dice by the symbol. And then there's a little gold symbol, which is a discount value. Now, this is equal to the opposite side of the die minus one. So like if you have a four, the other side of a four is a two, which gives you a discount of one. Or if you have a five, uh, you get a discount. Sorry, if four has a discount of two, because uh, when you flip a four over, it's a three, and a three minus one is two. And uh, a one gives you a five discount, because when you flip a one over, it's a six, and you subtract one, and you get five. And a six is no discount. But like to make it easier to do that math, it's right there in the It's just a little symbol to do this discount amount. That is almost asking too much information from a simple little six-sided die. Yeah, these are standard side dice. I didn't have the problem with it. Plus, like I said, you can do the math if you know what it is. Uh, you might, and plus it's like you, all you got to know is one through five. And after playing once, you're going to remember what those discards well, are. Well, I'm just thinking and the again, number the of other... mechanics wedged onto one little d6. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is three different things on each yep. die, which is kind of impressive. Now, each turn, you're going to take your warden, which is a little meeple for your army, and you're going to place it either on one of the five shrines that has a die on it, or you're going to place it on your board in your camp. And you only do that to perform a battle. What's important is that every turn you do have to move. You can't stay in the same place, which is why this does have a worker placement element. Uh, otherwise, you just pick a spot and take a die. Uh, when you place on a die, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to draft one of the dice from that shrine, and you're going to place it on your player board. You start the game limited to three, but you can unlock up to five slots for dice. Then after taking the die, you then do the action for that shrine. Well, when we're talking about wardens, this is essentially the, the leader of your clan or, you know, race or yeah, your, whatever. Yeah, your the... warband, your army. It's like the, the, the it's, it's your, your lieutenant or whatever that you're moving out to, to collect resources. Right. So there are five shrines. And really to understand the game, I'm going to have to go through each of the shrines pretty quickly. So first it's a gem shrine. You're going to take a die and take a gem. Now you can only hold one gem at the start of the game. And again, you can unlock more slots up to three. And what these do is these are a way to mitigate the die rolls. One gem can flip a die over to its opposite side, or it can make a die wild, counting it as belonging to any of the armies. So with all this talk of unlocking both on, the uh, on these two shrines, this really seems like a progression driven game. Yeah. Uh, do things, get more things so that you can do more things to get more things. Yeah, pretty much that way. Um, some of the stuff you're just unlocking to to give you more room, like more freedom, like you'll remove a cap, and other things do literally give you new actions. So it's a, it's a combination of both. So some give you more space and some give you new abilities. So the Magic Shrine is next. This one is take a die and either get two magic or claim an award. Now, magic is another thing that's used to mitigate dice. It can be used for a couple things. First, you can roll up any of your dice by ones for spending one magic per point. So turn a three into a four for one magic. Second, it can be used to cycle through the cards on the board. So when you're going to buy a champion or a battle plan, you can spend a magic to remove one of the cards from the play area, put it to the bottom of the deck, and draw a new one. Now, the awards are randomized at the beginning of the game, and they're going to reward players to achieve whatever's shown on the card. And the first player to get an award gets a bunch of points. The second player gets less points. And anyone else that completes it after the second player gets some points, but it's the worst amount. 
Now, these include all kinds of different things like having a certain pair, pattern on your campaign board, having a certain set of battle plans of different types, or collecting a set number of champions, or having so many things reserved, or having so many dice, all kinds of different variety here. So this is uh, sort of split between a victory bonus area for endgame and uh, part of that the sort of um, engine mechanic where you've got that magic to, to help uh, kick things along when you're doing other things. Yeah, in a way, it's, it's, it's a race, right? So this is a get this thing before anyone else gets this thing. Right. Now, the champion shrine. This, you take a die and then buy a champion. So these represent like heroes in your army. You get to apply that discount value of the die to the cost of the champions. And the champion come in three types. There's instants. So you buy the champion and it does something and it's done. Usually gives you some resources. They're dirt cheap. There's ongoing champions that give you some kind of special ability that keeps going. They cost a little bit more. And then there's end game champions that don't give you anything during play, but will give you end game scoring opportunities. And those are the most expensive. Now, there are a ton of champions that come with the game, and they all do all kinds of things. Like, there's no way I can cover all of it. Basically, you can get in-game resources, you can get extra strength, or you can get victory points from completing certain types of battle. You can get discounts on future actions. Uh, they can give you rewards when you take actions. Like, uh, there's a huge mix. And then calling back to one of Daily Magic's other games, it also has a mechanic that I remember from Valeria Card Kingdoms, where you have to pay more for collecting champions of the same type you already have, where if you pay one for every one you already have of that type. Now, again, there's an unlocking mechanic here. At the start of the game, you can only have three champions, but you can unlock slots for up to ten. Oh, well, at least they're keeping the uh, the unlocking theme rolling. Jeez. Next is the gold shrine. This is one of the simplest ones. You take a die, then you get gold equal to the absolute value of the discount value. So normally a two would give you a four discount. One said you get four gold and a five would give you one gold. Now gold is needed to pay for those champions and battle plans, which we'll get to in a second. Got to get that bling somehow. So next, the uh, most complicated shrine is the tactic shrine. You take a die and you reserve one of the in-play battle plans. You apply the discount value on the die to the cost because now there's a row of five battle plans on the board that cost from one to five gold each. When you reserve a battle plan, it goes into this reserve spot under your player board. Now, only one of those is unlocked at the beginning of the game, but up to three can be unlocked. And each of those gives you a bonus if you reserve a card here. For example, the first one lets you spend one gold to increase your influence, which we'll find out is very important in just a minute. So more unlocking, this time marching orders for your horde. All right, next is the camp. So this is not a shrine. This is you place on your player board, and you only do this when you have a battle plan and you are ready to perform a battle. First, you're going to select which battle plan to complete. Now, this can be one you reserve from the tactic shrine, or it can be any of the ones that are face up on the board. You just have to pay the gold to get them. Now, each battle plan lists one of three types. It's either a bow and arrow, an axe, or a catapult, and they list two to four dice types on them. Now, these could be all the same die, all the same color, or it could be a mix and match of any of the five die types. To complete it, you're going to turn in a set of matching dice that match the symbols on the plan or the color. Now, remember, you can use gems to swap the color of a die, and you have an upgrade that lets you use one die type as wild. And this is dependent on the race. Like The red race can use red dice as wild, and the undead gray race can use gray dice as wild, and so on. The gargoyles can use black dice as wild. Um... Once your dice are to picked, so once you've got your dice match up to your thing, you will add up the strength. So this is your main number on the die. You're going to add any additional strength from champions and upgrades on your board. And then again, you can use your magic to roll up dice. This will give you a total for how much strength you're bringing to this battle. Which makes you think you just want the biggest numbers you can. But the problem is your army is only as good as your influence. Influence is a cap. You can't have a battle total higher than your influence. So what happens is, say I got 36 on my, well, 36 would be crazy, 18 on my dice, I got three sixes, but my influence is only 12, well, my battle total can be 12 only. It can't be any better. So what you're going to do now is once you have your adjusted battle total based on influence, you're going to look up on a chart and see how many victory points you get. If you have less than seven points, you only score one point. Hitting at least eight gets you three points, hitting at least 11 gets you six, hitting at least 14 gets you nine, and so on. It keeps scaling up. Now, use dice or return to the bag. 
the battle plan is pushed to the side of your playing board. Now, you've completed a battle. That means your army has learned something. You've raided Valeria, so you get to level up your army. And this gets to all that unlocking we talked about. What's going to happen is you're going to remove one of the 10 victory tokens from your player board and place it on the campaign board. Doing this does two things. First off, removing a victory token unlocks new things. This will let you do things like remove your resource cap of 14, hold more dice, collect more champions, unlock more battle plan reserve spots, unlock your racial ability, hold more gems, or give you a permanent plus one strength. And the token removed is placed on the campaign board, and what spot you cover up will give you bonus points based on what battle plan you completed. For example, there's a spot on each board that gives plus two points for each of the battle types. So if you completed a bow and arrow battle type, you can put your chip over the blow and arrow on the campaign board and get two extra points. There are others that give points based on what dice were used and so on. Now, in addition to that, the campaign board is actually a nine by nine grid. Or sorry, three by three grid. I said nine by nine. It's a nine spot grid, a three by three grid with nine spots. And if you put two tokens next to each other, you unlock a chain bonus. And this is shown on the board between them. Now, these include influence, the thing you need to be able to get your army out there, gold and magic, so all the free resources, drafting a die free off the board, or getting free champions off the main board. So not a simple just do X, get Y upgrade mechanic with the you know combo breakers and things going on. No, this is definitely like a lot of options and choice at this point. Like once you complete that first battle plan, what you choose to unlock is going to change which way your army develops going forward in the game. Now the game keeps keep doing this, rinse, repeat until someone has completed several battle plan seven battle plans, and then do some uh, finish off the round. So like everyone doesn't get one turn. If it's the first player's turn, everyone's going to go that one turn. If it's the last player's turn, they're going to go when the game ends. Uh, you just finish off the round. Then players get any end game points from the champions. Uh, you also get one point per die you still have left, and the player with the most points wins. All right, well, not a simple game. The scoring, scoring seems pretty straightforward, if not the path to get those points. Yeah. Now, in addition to the rules I just explained, which are the multiplayer game rules, the game also includes a solo mode. Uh, this has you playing against a ghost adversary player. Uh, it's pretty simple. What you do is you place the uh, another player, another color's warden on the gem shrine. And every time you take an action, the warden, uh, the adversary moves one spot clockwise. If it manages to get all the way around to the tactics shrine, they then automatically complete the most expensive battle plan. And now there's a little bit more to it about not being able to see the same spots and them getting bonus points. But you know what? I don't think it's worth getting into those details here. But I will say the solo game plays very similar to the multiplayer game. You know, a nice feature, even if it's not one that a majority of players might use, there are a growing number of solo players out there, especially in times like these. Yes. Hell, I, I actually played it solo, <laughs> which I don't do very often. Now, as for playing the game, uh, actual thoughts on the game, I am digging it a lot. Uh, but I do need to know it is very different from the other games in the Valeria series I've played. All the other games I've played have been card-driven and generally involve using those cards to get resources to buy more cards and build a tableau. While Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria does have cards, I wouldn't call this card-driven. This is definitely much more of a worker placement dice drafting set collection game where the cards are there, but they represent bonuses and goals that you're trying to achieve. Now, I'm not saying this is bad. I just think it's important that fans, especially Valeria fans, should know that this is a twist on what you get from the other games in the series. Now, and this is actually, I think, kind of a big deal. The fact that this game diverges so greatly from the others can't really be stressed enough, not because it's bad, but because you don't want fans, and there are a number of fans of the Valeria system, having buyer's remorse if they were expecting more of the same. And to be honest, it's the same problem I saw with Horizons, which is a different game from Daily Magic Games, where everyone thought it was going to be Valeria in space, and it very much wasn't. It was very much a standalone game, but I think the expectation for that game was, oh, it's Daily Magic, it's going to be roll the dice to generate resources to play characters, or it's going to be draft characters from the center thing and build a tableau comprising of characters and buildings, because that's kind of what all the other games are. Right. Now, Shadow Kingdoms itself, I would not say is hard to learn. Um, I was able to teach my daughter uh, easily enough. It's not particularly heavy, but there are a lot of decision points in the game. 
and you are going to have a lot of options presented in front of you at once. What's interesting is that it still plays deceptively quickly. With most games we've had with experienced players, taking about an hour, depending on AP and how many people you're playing with, with solo games taking like 20 minutes. Well, and that seems about on par with the other Valeria games. I mean, I, I, an hour an hour or so with three people who understand the game and have you know played before, slap it down, get to it. Yeah, sounds about right. Like the, I've, I've had some card kingdoms go a little longer, but usually only until you get up to five players. Right. Anything shorter of that does seem pretty quick. Now, things I do like are the, the dice, the fact that you have multi-use dice that do different things. Like, I really like the way they use the, the discount versus the strength and how those two play out. Because in general, you want high dice numbers so that when you're completing battle plans, you get a ton of points, right? But if you do that, you're not getting any discounts. And if you don't get any discounts, you're going to run out of resources, especially gold, really quickly. So when you're buying for champions, like, I'm going to go buy a, I'm going to go to the champion shrine. I kind of want to because i want to complete a battle plan with a six but you know what if i take a one or two i'm going to save four or five gold on buying that champion which could be well worth it and then there's the fact that you can use your magic and gems to turn that one or two you drafted into higher numbers once it actually does get to battles and i think that's really neat the whole you want high or do you want low and the balance of the dice basically based on their opposite sides because their standard d6 is that seven Right. I also really like the influence system. I did thematically it makes sense to me. Like your army's only as good as your influence. It's only as good as your general. I thought that was cool. And I like having that cap. Like it just seems neat. Because yeah, I could go out there and collect all the sixes in the board, but it doesn't matter if my influence is sitting at starting you of ten. Right. So you've got a lot of aspects to manage, machines to build to make use of those lower dice and ratchet up their values with gems and magic. <laughs> it's it there's it's not a simple yeah, or simplistic no. game. I, I, yeah, I would say that. Now, there is one thing I was disappointed with. Um, probably no surprise to fans of the show. Uh, and that's a, a lack of asymmetry at the beginning of the game. Because when you read the rules and the background and you have these armies and these five different armies and recruiting different types of troops for your army, it just sounds like you're going to have a, a bigger difference between the different races. And then the campaign boards, when I first played, the first time I played it, I'm like, wow, look at this, five different two-sided campaign boards. That's a lot of different choices, and we're each going to get a different one. But then when you sit down and look at both those things, for one, the army, the only thing that it does by playing Knowles, which are the red army, is that I can unlock an ability that means red dice are wild. If I play the undead, which are white, well, I can unlock an ability that makes the white dice wild. And if I play the gargoyles, I can unlock an ability that makes the black dice wild. That's it. That's all you get for, for asymmetry, which really isn't to me. Like, to me, it's all the same. They just consider a different die wild. And then the campaign boards seem like they're really different until you look at them. And then you realize there are the exact same symbols on every single one, every side, but just in different order. Right. So none of the Valeria games strike me as highly asymmetric, but... I think the number of choices and the way that a player can choose their path and go off in very different directions uh, is what allows the divergence in these games, right? So they, they, I think they, I, they almost seem to like that lack of asymmetry at the beginning because the game itself has such a variety of options. I, fair enough. And, and to be honest, that is definitely a design goal for them is that the game becomes more asymmetric as it goes on. Right. The, the more you play, like what you choose to do, which champions you hire and what you unlock is probably going to be different than what champions I hire and what I unlock. And that is going to make our armies completely different by the end of the game. So that is definitely fair. It just everyone knows how much I like asymmetry. I want it at the beginning. I, I want to craft a clan and get some unique ability. Like, even just looking at the game, having played it a, a solid number of times, when I'm playing the Knolls, I want it that whenever I use a Knoll die, for every brown die, I get plus one because Knolls are dogs and they have pack tactics. And when I'm playing Undead, after I've completed a battle, I should be able to take my lowest level die and put it back on my board because I've re-resurrected my troops. Like, just to me, that would it fits the mechanics and it fits the theme better. Right. But I agree. The game does diverge from the original. It's a totally point. <laughs> like more maybe maybe what i'm thinking what i what they might need to do is add that in as an expansion later like toss that in like 
maybe they're avoiding that for the the initial game and they have plans because i gotta say daily magic is famous famous for small box small expansions that actually add quite a bit to the games that are relatively cheap and maybe we'll see something like that coming well it's interesting and anchi games in the chat room pointed out something uh you know card kingdoms isn't asymmetrical so why would she expect yes it is you get a duke at the beginning of the game that is totally unique from everyone else yeah, well, I have issues with the Dukes, but they, that doesn't change the fact. I know you don't like that's the, just rules scoring. For the Dukes, that's, but, it does but that doesn't. Symmetric. But well, that's just your, your end game scoring, though. That doesn't affect the game. Yeah, it you... does because what you go for is going to be completely dependent on what you're going to score at the end of the game. That's what you don't like about the game. Well, I don't. Well, I don't that like that it is because <laughs> what I don't like is the fact that it's that the grammar is wrong and I can't. Uh, I, I always go for the wrong thing because I it doesn't read right for, to me, but. <laughs> It's an game goal, and it gives yep. you something to yep. aim for. It gives you direction. But, Plus, with the latest, it was Shadow Veil. Vale, you also get an artifact, so you get two things that make your race asymmetric. So no, that is in their games. Okay. Now I got to make Quest of Valeria and Villages of Valeria. I don't think have anything asymmetric. But I mean, my my thought so is fair. a lot of the times when we see these uh, player boards, right, specific player yeah. boards, that really drives our belief in asymmetry yes. right why are you going to have all these fancy different player boards for all these different races if, if it's not really asymmetric insane. uh and yeah. so i i think there's an expectation with player boards like that Fair. that that drives that that want of asymmetry i'll put it this i i don't think they're the same designer actually i'm positive they're not because levi Moat's the designer of the other yeah. one and i don't remember if i mentioned the name of the designer in this one it's in the written review i probably should have threw that in the show notes once i looked it up um Look at Horizons, where you have the human sides of the boards, where mm -hmm. everyone's the same, and then you can flip it to the alien side of the board with unique abilities. Right. I would love to see something like that for this. Like, I have the... It doesn't have to be humans, but it could be, like, here's the orcs, and then there's the advanced orcs or whatever. Right. And I don't know what the orcs get instead of the other races, but I think it'd be cool. Anyway, this, again, this is minor, right? So this is not a huge complaint it's just something when i see player board like sean's i see it and i read it and we're all going to play different armies i want my armies to feel different i want my orcs to feel different than my skeletons to feel different from uh my my I, was it gargoyles i'm trying to remember the there's orcs uh undead gnolls gargoyles and i cannot remember what the last oh uh green things goblins probably right. in this game sorry stan kordanov's Kordonsky, Stan Kordonsky is the the designer of this game. So this uh, is another thing that I think is worth noting. That's important uh, is there is not a lot of player interaction in Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria, like except for the fact that I might take a die you want, and I might do that intentionally. It could be hate drafting, but more likely it's just I took something I wanted and it ends up you wanted it too. And the race to get those three awards before anyone else. There isn't really any way to influence the other players play at all. Like none of the champions affect anything except your own stuff. Like there's no steal gold or take a die. None of that is in this. And I think this is going to be a huge plus for some players and possibly a minus for others who like the direct conflict. Yeah, no. And this is, this is, uh, you know, we've talked about it, you know, group solitaire. It's a divisive topic. Yeah, in gaming right now, uh, we talk about it a lot in our Euro Games versus American Style episode. We did. Now, what I would love to see is what they did. I, I guess I bring up Horizons a lot. Same publisher. What do you expect? In Horizons, it's a 3X game. It's missing the fourth X, Extermination. You can buy a separate expansion called Extermination that adds player versus player conflict. I would love to see that come out for this. I would I would love to see a Shadow Kings of Very expansion that all it has to do is add some champions in that let me steal champions from other players, put something on a die, block a shrine so no one can go there. I don't I don't know exactly what the design would be, but it seems like it would easily integrate with the game. And I gotta say, slavering hordes, warbands fighting against each other to become prominent really fits well in theme to me. Absolutely. All right, overall, I found a lot to like in this game. Um, now, it doesn't really play like the other Valeria games to me, but you know what? I think it's a great addition to the line of games. It's a very cool worker placement dice drafting game with plenty of ways to mitigate the randomness of the dice. So if you're worried about the dice with the, the fact that even though dice are useful because of the discount and the fact you have the gems and the magic to be able to spin them up and flip them over... I, I never felt that I was stuck 
in the game because the bad dice only were up. The mechanics are pretty simple to learn, and I gotta say, it plays surprisingly quick for the amount of time decision there is. Like there are a lot of options here. You got five shrines to pick from every turn. Well, t technically four because you'd be on one of them. But you have five different options every turn and different ways to go. Uh, I'm surprised by how quick it can be. Now I gotta admit, I I would have preferred the armies were a bit more asymmetric. Um, but you know what? I've never had a bad time playing this game at all player counts. I guess I say, when this goes live, again, July 7th, um, if you're listening to this way after that, hopefully it's in your, your local stores, I recommend checking this game out. Now, this goes for people who are fans of Valeria games in general. If you just want a game with beautiful Miko art, you got one right here. That board, oh, it's so beautiful. Um, but I think people who dig worker placement games and people who like dice-based games that are doing something different. Like, this isn't your standard. This isn't even like Alien Frontiers. It's doing something different with D6s. I wouldn't say they're standard dice because they do have extra symbols on them. But just with D6-based dice. I think there is a lot to like here for a wide range of hobby gamers. All right, well, for a more in-depth look at this prototype version of Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria, you can read head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. And now, the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? Each week, we like to do one of these looks backs, right? We take a look at what happened since we were last here, what games hit our tables, anything else that we played, any events we attended, or other cool gaming stuff that's going on. So, up first was a two-player card game called Katana. Uh, this is a game set in feudal Japan that represents two dueling samurais. You 100% card base. Um, you're going to start off with four health and four armor and a kami card, which gives you unique abilities. Now, this kami represents one of the Japanese spirits that are, I, I don't know if you're praying to them or they're watching over your samurai or they're blessing you. I don't, I'm not sure exactly how the tie to the kami is, but basically it's, it's a card that gives you special abilities. And uh, just to be clear, that's, uh, Kami, K-A-M-I, not C-O-M-M-I-E. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, very thematic and simple, wow. much in keeping with the aesthetic of a samurai duel. Soviet Russia, Katana stabs you. I don't know. Wow. I wasn't expecting that one. That threw me right off. <laughs> All right. Katana, the game... Uh, the common the gods the japanese spirits uh features multi-use cards that i gotta say have some of the nicest visual aesthetic i've seen like these are just like striking like you just look at it and go wow that's a nice looking card I, I i don't know how to describe it better than that and they are of some of the best quality i have ever felt in a game that wasn't just like a deck of nice bicycle cards like they are the linen finished plasticized like these are nice cards now, the actual gameplay resolves around players taking turns playing cards. Um, you've only got a hand of five cards, and all of the cards have an attack, a defense, and a stance on them. And you can play any number of those cards and just attack, 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 attack if you want. But you don't get to redraw your hand until the next turn. So you probably want to hold some cards back to defend. So you probably could go all at attack if you want. Now, in addition, at the end of the round, you can play a card face down. And that represents your defensive stance coming round. So again, a slow battle with great thought and careful, thoughtful actions with each thrust or parry having consequences. They're really hitting this, you know, samurai duel theme right yeah, on the nose. I, I think they did, a, they did a good job on that. And then with that is an entire system based on your spirit and the pollution and purity of your spirit. So if you attack your opponent and you get through the armor and draw blood, the round ends because you've drawn blood. You have to stop your attack at that point. But you've drawn blood and touching blood pollutes your kami. And then there are also pollution cards that you can play on your opponent. So sometimes the defense part of a card will say pollution. And when you're defending, instead of just defending and soaking damage, you can play a pollution card on your opponent and then they get their kami gets polluted. Or instead of attacking, you can try to pollute their kami instead. And as your kami gets more and more polluted, you start losing abilities. Now, similarly, there's the opposite side of this. There are purification cards. And then you can use those to remove pollution. But those take up your action for the turn. So you're not getting to attack. 
you just purify yourself. So not only the duel itself in that slow, slow and thoughtful process, but the mysticism surrounding the duel and the beliefs of the fighters and how it affects them on the field. Yeah. So the entire concept seems really decent. Like there's some really neat stuff here. There's some interesting, as Sean's already noted, it ties into the theme surprisingly well for, for a simple game. But I got to say our first play was rough, like really rough. And this was all due to the rule book. I am sorry to say, but this is one of the worst rule books I have ever read. Um, to make things worse, the designer also sent me this fairly thick example playbook that kind of walks you through a few turns of play. And there's a couple rules in there that seem to contradict the rules in here. And then there is specifically one rule that's not in this at all, but is in the example book. Which led to some awkward confusion on Twitter, I noticed. Yeah, there was definitely that. What you didn't see was the Instagram conversation with the designer themselves. So I actually thought, based on some of the language in this, that this was a translation issue. So I brought that up with the designer and I said, um, I, I can't remember how I worded it, but I basically said, you know, it looks like you could have used someone to, to retranslate or had someone look at it. And they pointed out that they were an English speaker and quite offended that no one has ever given them such harsh criticism before. So I do apologize. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I, it is what it is. I, it wasn't just me. Deanna was trying to figure out the rules herself too. Now on a positive note, I do have to give thumbs up that I was able to contact the designer and that did mean I get to ask a bunch of questions and I was able to figure out the proper rules eventually. Now I did make the very strong suggestion that they put up an FAQ on their webpage or board game geek or both as quickly as possible for other people that may have this problem. And now, while I'm certainly not in any way happy to see the designer offended, if the rules are that problematic, it is better to suffer a small embarrassment, get some assistance, and get clarity to anyone who may have purchased or be purchasing the game, then suffer from people dismissing and review bombing a game because they can't understand the rules. Yeah. There was one of the reviews I read in trying to figure out the game that actually said, my wife and I couldn't figure out the game. We had to read another review and watch a video before we could figure it out. So I, was, I, I wouldn't say glad, but I was pleased to see that it wasn't just me. Right. <laughs> to other people who seem to have, have some difficulty with this. Now, as for the game, the actual gameplay, except for the fact that the two of us spent most of the time passing the two books back and forth and trying to find specific rules, it seemed to play pretty well. It's definitely more than just war or rock, paper, scissors, where like one card beats this card beats that card. There's definitely a lot more than that going on, which that's really cool. But what I need to do now, again, this isn't a full review at this point, this is only after a couple plays, is I need to sit down and play it again now that we've gotten clarification on the rule questions. Yeah, and I have to say, this one intrigues me. Uh, the way they seem to have captured the theme of what is a samurai duel so thoroughly in, in what is, in, you know, in essence, obviously not quite, but a simple card game uh, yep. really catches my eye, and, I, and I'm looking forward to uh, getting to try this one. All right, another one that hit my table uh, quite a few times in the last week, of course, is Shadow Kings of Valeria. Um, now, I've already reviewed this, so the only thing I want to note here that I didn't mention earlier, a couple things, actually, is that I've now played it with my oldest daughter, who's only 12, and she really enjoyed it. And that's cool, because this is probably the most complicated game we've tried introducing her to, uh, where she's making decisions on her own. Like Mice and Mystics is definitely not a simple game, but it's cooperative, right? This is where she had to make all her own choices. And I got to say, she picked on it, picked up on it very quickly. Um, it, it just shows how approachable this game can be. Now, I don't know if I'd say it's a gateway game, because unlike many 12-year-olds out there, my daughter has played games. She has played Valeria Card Kingdoms, for example. Um, what she did really like, which was funny, how much was the fact it was a prototype. She just thought it was so neat that we were playing a prototype. And she also thought it was really cool that it was in the same world as Valeria Card Kingdoms. And she didn't realize that um, game licenses were a thing. Like she didn't never thought that right. you could get multiple board games in the same world. Like it just had never occurred to her. And that kind of blew her, blew her mind. So you're grooming another Miko fan then, are you? 
Oh, I don't know about that one. She did have a couple comments about some of the art. Some of it was a little creepy to her. No, you are playing bad guys in this game. Um, she went with the undead because they had glowing pink eyes. Now, in addition to playing with her, I did try the game solo. Um, I think I've said this before on the podcast, but I'll repeat it here. I am not a solo gamer as far as board games go. If it's just me and I feel like playing games and no one else around, I boot up a video game. Uh, currently, that would be XCOM 2. Um, but I wanted to give this a shot solo so I could include my opinion of it in the preview. Um, I played through two games and I think both together took under 40 minutes, which was crazy. Like this game is lightning quick solo. Um, and it is really similar to playing the base game. Cause as I noted in the review, it has a very low player interaction in the first place. And it already had that multiplayer solitaire feel. So just playing it solitaire didn't really feel that different. It felt almost the same as playing a normal game. Now, what you do have is a few additional constraints because there's less dice on the board. So you're going to have less options. Plus you can't actually move to the shrine where the adversary is in. So that limits your number of options every turn. Now I got to admit, I'm probably not going to start playing solo games, every game in my collection as a new hobby. Uh, thankfully in my quarantine household we do have other gamers but you know what for a solo play this was quite fun that and i'm shocking because i don't think i've ever heard you talk about a solo board game uh outside of reviews now i realize you did this because of the review but uh it's just you know solo board games aren't a thing at your house <laughs> no not really like i i do not have a lot of experience with them um this is long before we even started the podcast i did try to own a rim uh, which was a solo game in the Oniverse games. And I did play Friday, which was a, a really neat solo deck builder. Uh, but you know what? Like Those were our solo only games. So like that's the only way to play them. I honestly can't think of any of the multiplayer games I own that you can play solo that I've actually tried the solo mode. Fair enough. I mean, we also know that you're not a big fan of rule of games that have modified rule sets. Yes. So even if it's a two player version, you don't, you know, don't don't modify the rules for the game. Yeah, there's, there's like put it this way, Race for the Galaxy, one of my favorite games of all time. I have an expansion that like does a whole autonomous thing and a separate board that is literally not even in my game room. It's packed away in one of the expansion boxes with every bit that because once that expansion came out, the next expansion came out with more for it, and like I know I it's literally not even in my game room. It's in in my in my laundry room where I have like empty boxes stored. Just not my thing normally. But I wanted I wanted people to know. Like I said this is a Kickstarter for a company I really like, so I, I wanted to uh, to make sure I tried all possible play modes for this one. Got to cover it fairly. So moving on, uh, yesterday I played a couple games with the kids, uh, both kids this time, the young and the old. Uh, Deanna happened to be at her mom's working on taxes, so we had some time to ourselves to try out some of the new games I've gotten. So up first was Super Cats. Uh, this is from the Op Games. Uh, this has got to be one of the most unique games I own, and that's saying a lot because I own a lot of games. This is a card game where there is nothing on the cards except artwork on both sides like there's there's nothing there's no numbers there's no mechanics there's no suits there, there's literally nothing but pictures of cats and on the other side pictures of cats in superhero gear that's it that's it that's the entire set of cards and then there's a bunch of other cards for the robo dog which are black on the back and have art on the front and they make a big robo dog that's it like if you want to see this yourself we're going to put out an unboxing video um, we might try to get this one on Monday just because this will probably be a pretty quick turnaround for a review because I don't think I need to play this one a ton of times to really dig everything it has to offer. Um, so we'll see about that one. So for those not in the know uh, or up to date, uh, the Op Games is the new rebranded name for what used to be and is still subtitled as USA Opoly. Yeah, they, they have been trying to get people to stop thinking about them as the company that makes Monopoly variants, which is why they were called USA Opoly. They're the people behind all the blah, blah, blah Opoly, like Dash Hound Opoly and Dog Opoly and Windsor Opoly. They put out all that, which is, makes sense why they were USA Opoly. Uh, but yeah, they've been doing a lot of stuff that's not that for a long time, actually. Like, it, it's not a new thing. So I actually think it's a good rebranding mm -hmm. so that people don't just think of them as the Monopoly people. Now, Super Cats. Dead simple game where you're forming a team of superhero cats getting ready to fight Robodog. 
you start off in part one, and in part one, you're going to each grab five cats, and you're going to put them in front of you, and then you're going to try to be the first team that you're going to try to be the winning team. Like, you're going to try to beat out the other teams for your chance to fight the supervillain. And you do this kind of a rock, paper, scissors, is a bad example because it doesn't use the rock, paper mechanic, but you go super cats and then you hold out zero through five fingers. Then you look at everyone else at the table and the player with the highest unique number showing wins. By winning, they then get to flip over some of their cats to the super side. And then there's a little bit more to it based on what number's chosen. So like if you win with a zero, which obviously is going to be pretty hard, it means everyone else had to tie you're going to get to flip two cats. Whereas if you do a five, which is the highest number possible, so it's a pretty good chance you'll win, you only get to flip one cat, but then next turn you got to throw a two. So everyone knows what you're going to say next turn. And then there's other rules ones in between. The first player to have all their cats flipped to the super zero side wins the first round. Well, that sounds like a game. <laughs> yep, it definitely is a game. But wait, there's more. That's only round one. In round two, the player that won round one faces off against RoboDog. Now, RoboDog is played by all the other players. Here again, players are going to hold out numbers. They're going to go RoboDog and hold out zero to five fingers. If the hero team, the, the good guys, show a unique number, they do that much damage to RoboDog. And RoboDog is made of 11 cards. You just take off cards until all of RoboDog is gone. If any of the RoboDog players match the hero, though, the hero then has to flip back over that number of cats to their normal side. If the hero runs out of super cats, they lose. Whereas if they do 11 damage to RoboDog, they win. And that's it. That's the game. That is super cats. Not what you'd call a thinky game. Not at all. I don't, I don't need it. Like that basically we just gave the full review, right? Like I, I don't even know if we need to cover this in a future episode. We probably will. I'll, I'll put out a written review at some point with a bit more details. Uh, I got to say this had mixed results. I, I got to say it's dead simple. I actually thought the mechanic was neat. I, I actually liked the, I guess, social deduction of trying to come up with a unique number and how hard that was to do and how like a five is really powerful, but you get penalized for it. And how a zero is awesome, but, like, the only way to get it is if everyone ties. Like, that's kind of neat. And it definitely beats, like, rock, paper, scissors. Like, there's definitely more of a game. Uh, I am a fan of the theme. I, I grew up watching a cartoon uh, from Japan called Samurai Pizza Cats. And this definitely has that feel. So I love the art. Uh, the kids love the art. Big G, uh, my oldest thought the game was fun. But Little G's review was literally, well, that's kind of stupid. Can I just look at the cats now? So not a shining review there from my youngest, who is the one I actually thought would enjoy it more. Now, at this point, I have only played this with kids, young kids, uh, 12 and under. I actually think, like, I want to try this with adults because I think this could be fun at a party or, or gaming in the New Year's, uh, potentially with drinks involved, something at easy mode once it opens back up, or even 3 a.m. when everyone's a little punch drunk at extra light. I, I really want to see if a group of adults willing to play, like in the mood to play, like like I'm thinking our game of Rhino Hero level of like seeing Tori just laugh at the cat with its ass facing you, but I, like level of play. I think it could be a lot of fun. Yeah, and I'm just not sure if I've been in that silly a mode, even 3 a.m. at Extra Life. Yeah. Uh, I do choose to avoid recreational chemicals. And unlike yourself, I was never a Pizza Cats fan. So I don't have that connection to it. Um, honestly, I'm not seeing it, but that's me. Yeah, I don't know. I want to try. It. I don't know that that that's the review. The final review for this is probably going to have to wait until we can gather with more people. I, I have to try it with a group of adults who are are willing to give it a shot. I think it's mainly Tori and Kat. I think are going to love it. So I, I think I think there is going to be a crowd out there that enjoys this game. I, I was really surprised my girls didn't go nuts over it. Like, I, like we played twice, and then I'm like, you want to play again? They're like, mm, can we play something else? And I'm like, wow, really? Okay, then. Like, I think it's cats. I'm like, I, my, and like this still beats a lot of kids' games, in my opinion. There, there's more game here than some of the kids' games on the market, but my kids don't own those games. They play stuff that's a little more complicated. I don't know. I, I haven't totally written it off, but... I'm still shocked that you can put out a game that, like, no rules. Like, like there's nothing there. That That's still weird 
to me when I was unboxing it. I'm sure in the in the video, I'm like, what is this? What do you do with this? I don't understand. So since the kids did say, I don't want to play this again, can we try something else? I looked around my game room, and I wasn't sure what to grab, and then I noticed the mind. Now, I, I, I'm assuming at this point most people know what the mind is. You're trying to play cards in order from number one to 100, and you're not allowed to talk. You're dealt, uh, in round one, you're dealt a hand to one card. You just have to put the cards down in order, but you're not allowed to talk. That's pretty much the concept of the mind. If you beat level one, you go to level two, and now you have a hand of two cards and a hand of three cards. And for people who haven't seen the mind, you're probably listening to this going, that sounds dumb. you got to try it. The mind is a very neat, I'm going to say a game, because there's enough people out there who don't think it's a game. <laughs> We've had that argument back when the game came out. Um, so I introduced this to the kids, and i got to say the first thing, the, the concept blew their minds. Like, what? We're not allowed to talk? Well, how are we going to know what to play? Like, like how, how do we know when to put our card down? And and they got it right away. Like the 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 pause, the waiting, the 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 that aspect of the game, that the how to play the mind, they definitely got. And it went really well for like level one and two. Maybe I think we got to level two on the first game, and then it started to fall apart. Now the problem here wasn't anything wrong with the game. I, like there was nothing wrong with the mind. The problem is my youngest daughter has a diagnosed learning disability and was having a really hard time reading the cards in her hand. She was having the most trouble with forwards and backwards of the numbers, so she would mix up an 83 for a 38, for example. So I would throw down a 27, and then she'd throw down an 83, thinking she was throwing down a 38, and of course by throwing down an 83, that she broke the game. Unfortunately, that just means that the mind does not work for her, which is a shame, because all of us were really enjoying it until this came up a couple times. And you know what? At that point, it was time to quit playing because she was getting frustrated. Her sister was getting frustrated because we were losing. It just, unfortunately, is a game that people with um, certain types of learning disabilities aren't going to be able to play. Yeah, unfortunately, that game can't be easily adapted for that particular concern because with the lack of ability to speak, um, you can't even really use a helper essentially yeah uh, the only i mean the only easy solution i could think of would be some sort of a card reading app and earbuds so that they could talk to you about cards like if you and you only know, they yeah but the timing but, of that game yeah. having to listen to it wouldn't work exactly like would it's, it it's uh it, it, that would be a really tough one to uh to be able to adapt for that the only thing i think of that might work is a complete redesign of the cards using a different font that's a little easier to read with certain types of numbers possibly digital numbers yeah um, but like, I, I would have to remake the entire deck and to be honest, there's enough other games out there. She does enjoy. So that one is going to unfortunately get tossed off uh, out of our pile for playing with her. Right. I'm still probably going to keep the game and enjoy it. That was my first play of my own copy. And as far as I know, my first play with an actual deck of mind cards, because when I did play it at origins, it was just someone with like a stack of cards because <laughs> everyone kind of knew the system. It right. wasn't with the real cards. So I, I the game's still cool, but it's it's a thing i it's not even something i considered right so that that was that was definitely a little a, a different experience than we expected right so that's it for mine um not a huge week but quite a bit did you get into any gaming this week uh unfortunately no um i'm in training right now and should be in wisconsin uh but <laughs> of course it's and, and that's actually the reason i wouldn't have been at origins this year uh, was because was because of this trip to Wisconsin, but due to the pandemic, uh, just like everyone's gaming training gets to be virtual as well. Well, how about a look ahead? Uh, what have you got planned for the coming week? Uh, so in the coming week, the main thing I plan to do is play some more katana. Um, now that we know the proper rules, uh, there's one more rule question I'm waiting for an answer on from the designer. Once I hit that, then uh, then we're going to play in a couple more games of that. Um, anyone else who's been following me on Twitter has seen that I've been busy rulebook reading. Uh, set to play all those games. I unboxed last week some other stuff from the op. Uh, I think the big one, uh, probably Friday night, actually, is going to be Talisman Batman Super Villain Edition. People seem to be jonesing for my opinion on that game, so... That's a big one. Um, I would like to say I'm going to play some more Shadow Kingdoms of Valyria, but I've actually been asked by Daily Magic to mail it off to another Canadian reviewer. So I'm going to be sad to see that go. Deanna's like, oh, you have to give that up? And I'm like, eh, I offered. I told them I would. 
So I'm yep. going to send that one off to someone else. So that one's, that one's done and over with at this point. Look forward to the Kickstarter edition coming out. Uh, that's uh, all I know of. Who knows? Uh, there, there'll probably be some more unlabeled to go uh, before <laughs> or during that Batman game. There we go. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate your support. Wayne Humphrey. Thanks, Star Wars guy. Roger Malosh. Thanks, Roger. Zopi. Thank you. David Miller Jr. Thanks, Dave. And Brian Kurtz. Thanks, Brian. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end. And we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Uh, if you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping your bellhop through our Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. And remember to join us here every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. Even if the stream drops out suddenly when I hit the next button, we will be right back. Yeah, we'll be right back. We're having technical difficulties with one scene, one scene in OBS. We don't know why. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.